eventually join the gang, just so I could walk through the answers. absolutely amazing. I think she's a genius. I think the guys are geniuses for building it. I just thought it was absolutely amazing. The great thing about this show is it reveals the glories of the Roundhouse. Fantastic space and it's unlike anything else. It was really nice to hear those stories for those hard to reach people really coming through, sort of bringing those unheard voices to the masses, which is amazing. I thought they were inspiring. I thought they were beautiful. I thought they were individual and unique and extraordinary. I think it really was all encompassing about what is really happening in our world and what's important. It was very, very inspiring. Absolutely amazing experience. So I'm Penny Walcock and I guess I'm an artist and I work primarily in film but I also direct opera and I've done some radio plays and I'm doing an installation at the Roundhouse so in a way it's just the best way to tell a story you know there's not a particular way in which I have to do it. I'm really interested I guess my most prevailing kind of passion is for um, what happens on the edges of society on the margins because I think what happens there with the people that we throw away is really tells us something crucial about the society that we live in. And I suppose also I feel really passionate that people shouldn't be thrown away and that their stories need to be heard and that they can tell them. So I'm always hoping that I can make a space in which people who are other people talk about get to talk for themselves. So that, that's a big part of what interests me. Yeah, my inspiration is very much about things that I don't know about or unexplored corners. And actually, I'm happy to do it here. I don't think you have to go to some... I mean, I think it's really important to go to other places and tell those stories. But, you know, f five yards away from here, there'll be things that, uh, that we don't know about and that are you know, if you look carefully at anything, it becomes fascinating, I think. So from, from the world, I think that's where I get my inspiration from. Yeah, Utopia at the Roundhouse is, we're trying to do something that's not been done before, I think. So you walk in, it's an installation that you can wander around. And as you do it, you'll trigger stories from unexpected sources and from people who you normally wouldn't hear about, very, very raw stories in which we kind of drag the city into the roundhouse. Most of the time we just pass each other like that. And it's not that we want to, it's that people don't know how to make those connections. And so I, I decided that I would do something that was really about the kind of disparity between, you know, rich and poor and different people's experience so it started off with going out and finding people to tell stories that I felt were you know really unique to them but that somehow told a bigger truth it's, it's a really powerful thing and that's why I really believe that art is not just decoration it's not some add-on you know and, and it's obviously a very easy cut it's something that's absolutely central to who we are as human beings and it and and the the potential for genuine change because it comes through creativity is um, it's like nothing else. Do you want me to start from the beginning or? If you don't mind. I don't see how you can ever get any real justice or prosperity so long as there's private property 
and everything's judged in terms of money. Unless you consider it just for the worst sort of people to have the best living conditions, or unless you're prepared to have a country prosperous, in which all of the wealth is owned by a tiny minority. My name is Awate, I'm a rapper and I grew up in Camden. Quite a lot of the people involved in the project are people who, who should get the call and get asked, hey, what do you think about the area? What do you think about art? What do you think about culture? What do you think about housing and poverty and, and how it all mixes and intersects? I am from Slovakia. I've been living in London for about 16 years now. So my name is Milik Sankara. I'm 26 years old. I'm a spoken word artist, an actor, and a creative practitioner. I wanted to share my story because I think it's similar to a lot of young people uh, living in London. Pulling it out there, so again, people hearing uh, stories that they can relate to, you know, and ultimately not feel they're alone in London. Well, my name is Eric Robinson, and uh, I had a very wonderful early life uh, making uh, motion pictures. I suppose I'm a graduate. I guess. Uh, well, actually, it's been a year and a half, so I don't know how long it, you can be a graduate for until it runs out. So I guess I'm just an unemployed person. <laughs> I, I get the impression with Penny that she sort of picks up on things, and I suppose she picked up on something interesting with me, which I didn't even see myself. It's a rare thing for someone to come up to you and actually take the time to listen to your story. I am 47 years old, a stay-at-home mum, I have two kids, a dog, a husband, and yeah, that's me. The project for me represents that there are lots of different walks of life and lots of different stories, and in a way it's an opportunity to tap into those stories because also in big city life you can walk by the same person every day and never acknowledge them. And this is a way, because I'm kind of nosy too, so you can open the door and find out something about them, and that can be quite enlightening and uh, quite touching. People have so much things to offer, so many life lessons and experiences. And it's only when you sit down and actually engage with people and have a conversation that you realise that, and nobody does it anymore. So a project like this is a great excuse to witness all of that. So my name's Steve Gallagher, and I'm one half of Block 9, and we are working with Penny Walcock on Utopia at the Roundhouse. We do a lot of festival work and yeah, we have a field at Glastonbury Festival called Block 9 and that is a um, bit of a showcase for our installations, our venues. Designing with sound in mind, on that scale we sort of, um, you know, we're, we're kind of used to doing that and with the other stuff that we do at Glastonbury, I mean, they're all based around music and musical genres so very specifically we're, we're thinking about what the sound of this thing is and then designing around that. So when you go into this war zone, this, you have this soundscape that in, uh, surrounds you, and then you have the individual interviews, which are effectively people talking about their lives, coming out from various corners of that installation. So we've taken the audio and the, you know, people's there's a variation in people's voices, you know, if somebody's sort of quietly spoken and softly spoken, so we're, you know, however that, you know, or if they're really sort of loud and raucous, whatever, we're sort of, kind of taking that all into consideration and, and hopefully reflecting that in the spaces that we've created. We're also using um, some hypersonic speakers which give a very directional quality uh, impact to the sound. So you, you, know, you, you are confined to a certain listening space um, and uh, that's going to be quite interesting. So you're just literally going to walk and you'll suddenly find sound appearing thrown at you, which is different and kind of a, you know, a new thing really, a new phenomena, so uh, hopefully we'll, uh, that will come across and, 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 and entertain people in a certain way. You know, I think we were an obvious choice for Penny and the Roundhouse um, to get on board with this project because, um, you know, the scale of what we, uh, of what we do, you know, we like to, we like to um, use the size of our work to uh, pack a punch um, and that's the case here in this installation as well, it's massive.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Utopia. That is a pretty tepid response to the arrival in Utopia. Right, let's try that again. Welcome to Utopia! Woo! Okay, that's a little bit better. Welcome, people. This is, uh, this is an exciting event, uh, and we're really glad you come to share it with us. So, I'm Sam Berkson. I'm Michelle Madsen. Uh, and we're here to talk to you uh, about Utopia and introduce this night, yeah? Woo! Well, how does that sound? Woo! So, you, as you may know, Utopia means literally no place. So, it's, it's not really an end that we're aiming for. It's not a possibility. It's, more, it's rather, for me, Utopia is a mindset. It's a way of thinking that where we believe in something better. And what we're going to be doing today, we've got people talking, some great speakers coming to talk, thinking about where we're at right now in the world and where we would like to be. You know, because we're not talking enough about where we'd like to be. And where we're at right now is pretty bleak, isn't it? Yeah, I'm afraid to say it is. You've got half the world living on two and a half dollars a day or less. Uh, we have... You know, people, thousands, millions of people dying from preventable disease. We have environmental destruction at an unprecedented rate. Oceans poisoned, ice caps melting. And all those humanitarian interventions in the global south have, as we told them it would, led predictably to a spiral of war across the Middle East, across North Africa, and... Inevitably, thousands of people have lost their homes and their refugees, and some of them have made their way to the West. We're here in the West. We have given them a very uncivilized welcome, and, uh, and, and, and they've come into a society that, which is, let's face it, where much of the economic activity around here is essentially pointless, where much of your culture is vacuous, uh, and, and your art is puerile, and, and yet... <laughs> You know, even this, Sam. Even this even is a this. little bit pure, you know. And that short-lived 50 years of social security that the West created after a lot of struggle is being gradually stripped away. Mental illness on the rise, obesity, ignorance higher than ever, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is where we are. And yet, and yet, people, they tell us that they, they, there is no other way. That this, as Mark Fisher says. Capitalist realism tells us this is the only way we can run things. Uh, but we, strangely, uh, have a certain amount of hope. And I hope you do too. That's why you're here. You know, there's a, there's a great saying, uh, an optimist knows how shit the world is. <laughs> a pessimist is still finding out. <laughs> so we are here, we are optimists, you know, because... Uh, we really believe that this is not the end of history. That's what I think. It's not the end of history. They, those people have not calculated on time being quite as long as it is, right? So we're here for change, and we're going to be talking about that this evening. And the change is something that you can all make. We can all make here. Um, so I'm delighted because the UV lights have come on that I can see lots of flashes of neon it's a little bit like a protest. Instead of high-vis policemen, you have bits of paper around you. Bits of paper, these empowering bits of paper. So we're going to play a little bit of a game, you see. Um, it's not just about what we're telling you about Utopia. We've got loads of amazing people coming up on stage to tell you what about how they believe that Utopia can work. I want to hear how you think Utopia can work. Bit of a difficult question, isn't it? I think if I just left it at that, everyone would be like, well... Uh, no war, please. War is rubbish. Um, I'd like my bins emptied and the pothole in the road. That needs to be filled in, definitely. Um, no Ebola, rubbish. Um, and on and on and so, so forth. So we're going to ask you instead to close your eyes, roundhouse. Close your eyes. And imagine yourselves waking up with your eyes closed. In the utopia that you can imagine, this utopia is no place. So I'm not going to ask you what that place is, but I'm going to ask you what you do on that day. How do you brush your teeth in a utopian society? 
Where do you go for breakfast? Do you eat breakfast? Do you share breakfast in a utopian society? What do you taste? What do you smell? What do you feel? What do you do? So throughout the night, you don't have to write that right now. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a challenge. I'd like you to think about it. Just think about it a little bit and write it down on a piece of paper. And we're going to get people to come and collect up all of these thoughts, these amazing utopian dreams. And Sam and I are going to write poems from that. And we're going to tell them to you at the end of the evening. So challenge us. How does that sound, Roundhouse? It's your utopia, Roundhouse. How does it sound? Good. We're going to be building up that utopia throughout the night. So uh, what we do normally is we are poets. Um, that's that, and we're hosting for tonight. Um, both of us, we've, get, we've written new poems to share with you, never before heard. Uh, so it is my great pleasure and honour to introduce to you one of the finest poets in London, host of Hammer and Tongue in Camden, in this here borough of London. Uh, please give it up for Michelle Madsen. So when I thought about utopia, I was um, confronted by the reality of my life. Um, I'm an optimist, you can tell. Um, and and that's, I live on a boat, so this is a very boat-themed utopia. It's called Lifeboats. When the price of a roof over your head is greater than its equal weight in gold or some other precious bauble of great human worth, don't panic. You can join us. We have a plan. We will build, we will make a place, no place without roots or great towers, ignoring splinters in fingers from pieces of driftwood, ignoring lum, numb lips, tired of blowing up stiff balloons, inflating hope for our floating republic. We can start small, a shed perhaps, its foundations, ruined plastic bag, jellyfish and the rusted carcasses of shopping trolleys. Dead things in bags will fertilize our food. On the flotsam and jetsam of the canal, we feed our children. But we will build, of course we will build. We will build shelters among the cadavers of trees, others on bricks which unfortunately will sink. But the shifting foundation of this land belongs to no man to no man, cannot be possessed. And so we grow and move equally, using only what we find, never touching the banks, planting seeds in the heavy silt which shores up our homes. From our no man's nomad island, we observe the rising of the waters. First an inch, then a foot, hard to notice from the shore, where we have our supporters. Yeah. They pass as victuals on lines, or if left, we fish for radioactive suppers, the stunted mutants of the waters filling our bellies. And you know what? They come from overseas to see us on the canals. This anarchic state adrift, capital-dwelling migrants from capital, nameless, rulerless, unpossessed, until the flood comes and we demur to forces greater than mankind. Après moi la Deleuze, they will shout from the rooted, huge vertical glass coffins. But what price property underwater? And so London becomes a latter day Atlantis, swallowed up by the hungry sea, gobbling up the Thames. And this tiny land, a utopia made of waste, is all that remains. And we are happy. We drift through time, rowing from one set of survivors to another, asking, why try to make what is ours yours? Why own anything at all? Noting how we all shift and change, even the atoms which make us and the smoke. And now what next? A pretext for her philosopher king, a price on air, and I say, how small our tiny little minds and how great we can make them. Great as the land, the sea, the sky, the waves, and hope. Thank you very much. <laughs> Woo! That was hopeful, really, I promise you.
Come over to my boat, you'll see that that's actually a lot more positive. Um, so, now it's my very, very great pleasure to introduce to you a very good friend of mine. You've just met him before, but he's the um, host of Hammer and Tongue in Hackney. He is also um, a fantastic poet. He's just written a book about uh, Sawahari um, refugees in the Western Sahara. Please put your hands together for the one and only Mr. Sam Berkson! Thanks guys. So yeah, the reason I'm a utopian is that I've got a serious conviction for the ethical good. No spurious distinction on who's best in the hood. Notoriously level-headed intelligent fella. I stand my ground in this rat race, won't chase after cheddar. Incredibly credible, check our credentials. Humans immensely eligible for the best of potentials. Yet your art rarely reaches beyond the inane and the sensual. Poison in the spirit, it's insane what they're selling you. You didn't think you wanted it, but now they've sold you one. Everybody chasing what they're told they want. Pause for a minute, man. Hold that blunt. Take a, uh, some time to reflect on what you really want. Food, clothes, shelter, time. People you can link with and stuff for the mind. Tools, craft, something to be prouder. Confidence that comes without the white powder. Realign the gravity that drives the waves. I'm patiently waiting for the tide to change. I need the world rearranged so my mind can rage. Believe I've seen the semblance of some brighter days. Overlapping, interlocking is the nature of the contrast. Distinguish, if you can, the dancer from the dance. Sensibly sensitive to my fellow's feelings. Intensely inventive at the right time and the season. I burn when the frowns are freezing. I write lines to give this town some fucking meaning. Ever cool in the heat and the hype. Rarely been a fool on the mic. So come, get a portion of what we dearly want. Re-examine what it is that we really want. Love. Affection, something to work for, some say and control over things that concern you. Art, oceans, views of the hills, happiness that comes without the white pills. Pop culture popping off, fizzy pop and bubble froth. Air freshener for the stench of where the flesh of corpses rot. I've been watching where the vultures sat. I don't know shit about your pop stars, but I still know where your culture's at. I see three billion slaves propping up the pyramid. Sweatshop, drug trade, right in the thick of it. Killing for concessions for the cults and mines of Congo. No concessions for the lives of the people underground though. Digging minerals for the gizmos assembled up in Shandong. So Westerners can waste their days playing Minecraft on their Samsung. Elaborate labyrinths that hide the monster's power. Apocalypse nightmares getting closer by the hour. They're pulling down the forests and they're putting up a tower. Reaching for the empty heavens heavy in our hearts. Examine what we really want could be a good start like games. Friendship, sense of togetherness, mutual aid, not respect. Survival of the cleverest, sustainable living, respect for the ecology, debt jubilee, not half-assed apology, ancient technologies and modern skills, sense of achievement without the dollar bills. Yeah, big up Utopia! Wicked. All right. So there we go. We're into Utopia, people. We've got three sections tonight, uh, and we're going to kick it off with the first section, uh, which is about the topic of migration. And unfortunately, uh, the, the way that the media gives people stories here means that many people have a very blinkered view of migration. They see people in Calais, and they don't think beyond that. And, and all our narratives are very dead end. They don't lead us anywhere good. So we're going to bring people on who are going to talk to you about a different view, a different different way of thinking about migration in the world. But first... First up, we have a fantastic, fantastic performer for you. He is um, one of the Apples and Snakes um, Heartland brothers. His name is Yomi Greed Shode. He's got a fantastic, fantastic show on at the South Bank Centre called Co. Please give him the most enormous, massive, roundhouse utopia, round of applause, and welcome onto stage. It is Yomi Greed Shode! This one cool? 
Wicked. Oh my God. Oh, hey. Hi guys. Oh, you guys all right? You okay? Wicked. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Roundhouse, for um, having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's really cool to open up. And I'm a bit nervous, but I'm just going to go through. All right, so, hi, my name is Yomi, a.k.a. Greeds. It's generating rhymes to engage the Latin soul. No, it doesn't mean if you give me a bunch of cupcakes, I'll eat it, or I'm the second most expensive thing in this exhibition. No. So now that's out of the way. Nice. So I've got three pieces to share with you. Um, and... So, just to give some context to it, um, I went to Nigeria in 2013. Oh, wicked! <laughs> yes! I don't know where you are, but cheers! Um, so, I went to Nigeria in 2013 after 21 years, right? And um, in the lead up to that, I'm hearing all sorts of things. I heard, one person told me, there's a Nando's up there. I said, shut up! Do you know? Um, and I went up there and, and I left. I spent a good month up there and I left with a number of feelings, a number of stuff written down. And I went up there thinking, oh my God, there's a Nando's up there. And I left thinking, I'm glad there's not a Nando's up there. Um, because there was so much learning. And this is literally what that says about. So, cheers. Thank you again. So, um, this first piece is called Deborah. You guys good? Bodacious. So, Deborah is nine. A Christian house, a girl raised in a Yoruba household. Her hair is short and rebellious. Her accent is thick, yet she is softly spoken. Daughter to parents too poor to keep her. She is the house help to grandma. The eyes as hers weaken, the legs as hers stiffen. Grandma pays the bearer for her keep for food and clothes, for education. Up by six and in school for eight. I help her fetch water this morning. The borough is shy, yet very thankful. My assistant allows her to breathe, and just like that, Deborah! Yes, ma? She's back to work. Deborah is nine, and not yet wise to the ways of life. In my Western eyes, she's nine, but not in the eyes of Africa, for she guides us, making us better people. She needs training, Grandma says, and when she's old enough, she will work and then decide whether she wants to stay. That afternoon, when Grandma punched her whole fist in her chest, the heel of Deborah's left foot shifted back, digging in the floor for balance. Her shoulder blades caved towards each other as if to console the pain. Her lips pushed forward, then stiffened for a moment. Everything paused. Today, she has learned a valuable lesson. One that she could not repeat if she dared to cry. She could not cry, so she bit her tongue, held her breath, praying grandma looked elsewhere, for when she was done with her, the borough could walk off, blowing the hurt in whimpers only heard by nature. She cried quick not making a sound. She cried quick, not making a sound, rubbing her chest, wishing that somebody would be there to tell her it's okay, that things would be better. For now though, the borough is quiet, but inside that tiny heart, I hear her, her anger churning like auntie's pot of ogi. I wonder whether she cries at night, I wonder, whether she prays for a better life, Deborah. Thanks. Um, yes, so, like I was saying, in the lead up to my trip, I'm finding out so many things, and at the time, there was a big campaign going on um, where there was, it was being discussed that they were going to consider the age of marriage um, with some the girls in, in Nigeria. There was a massive campaign, Child Not Bride, I don't know if you guys are aware of that, and it really did affect me. So I decided at the time to write an open letter to the president, the then president's wife, um, and this piece is called An Open Letter to Patience Jonathan. 
Dear Mrs. Jonathan, I wonder if you wake faced with a pulsing penis between your eyes and hands wrapped around your throat when you breathe. Do you inhale the dry sweat on uniforms of when who wear loyalty in the same vein the devil holds sin? Is your body a template for predators to salivate, to form with the mouth over? For I have seen their pictures. 35 men, the amount taken to etch my country into history for the wrong reasons, 35 in favor, leaving you and I stained. Mrs. Jonathan, you are every girl in a womb of scared mothers, counting down days before their child enters a world where people in power have superseded their desires. Although time has swallowed your youth, do you still recall memories for these children? Are they fruitful? Did you at any time wonder when you ran the field bare feet and bottomed? Have you sat on an uncle's lap, sucking on candy handed to you? Were you a good child? Do you think how these children will feel in your current time, Mrs. Jonathan? You choose to ignore this ill state my country is suffering from. How it spits in our face and you refuse to wipe, do you not care? Are you not ashamed for these senates whose hands part young thighs? Hands that you shake, that feel young girls lubricate in fear. These girls, worried it may scar or burn, their bodies protected by God. And if God spoke, he will say it's okay, child. Their time will come. These girls, with bodies not yet built for 40-year-old urges, would you stand by your side, hold your head up high, hand on heart, and swear on their innocence? For the residue of spun webs around us, looping Nigeria into a time that's not quite 2000 and now, Mrs. Jonathan. Slave masters have reincarnated in your senators, with eyes carrying a thirst for our children. They have fed their coven and shall take from loving families. They shall beat, they shall rape, they shall insult, they shall savage, they shall beat, they shall beat, they shall beat. They shall beat, they shall beat, like we do drums. Each thud for every time they fuck up, doing something wrong. How could they ever get it right so young? How could they be expected to think like adults at nine? Such myth, like grabbing air for support, Mrs. Jonathan. Thud, thud to the girl for being naive. Thud for not greeting him as he enters. Thud for forgetting his pure water. Thud for not allowing his beasting hands to rip her clothes to shreds. Thud for resisting, for trying to keep her legs closed, for crying, for not enjoying his panting, musky breath and chest hairs, for wanting to go to school, kick dirt, have confused crushes, get told off for staining her clothes. Thud, Mrs. Jonathan. For these men have considered laws to upskirt girls at 12, at 8. Will you sit as the underage wives serve you food? Will it swallow well? How will you feel when your husband no longer sees the youth in your eyes? Thank you. You guys good? You all right? I just want to test how many people's in here. Can I get like a year and a kind of free? I haven't said it yet. Um, sorry. So one, two, three. Yeah. That's a lot of you. It's, it's <laughs> this is my last piece. Um, it's, it's, it's really good to be here. Um, so it's called Other Kids Crying. Um, so I, like I said, Nigeria, I came here when I was like nine and at six, I recall a memory that I really could not make sense of until a, a, some time after. And um, I decided to write about it. Cool. Um, and I'm going to need you at some point, I feel. I think, I don't know yet, but let's see what happens. Cool? <laughs> cool. Other kids crying. That's what I remember. Children crying and, and white. That's what they wore, white. And at the point that the teachers told us to keep the noise down, I did not listen. She forgets that mother's blood runs through me, a thick fog-like substance. Don't like to be told what to do if the tone in my ear does not align in the way it should. And so I looked. Yeah, I looked. 
Age six, I looked because being moved from room to room looking up to chins as the fire alarm rings. Other children crying and I'm here thinking, what the hell is going on? Walking slow only to be pulled, pushed, told to hurry up, tripping up on my shoe. The good shoe now on its own as I am dragged. They think I'm being disobedient, but I'm like, if I do not get that shoe, I'll be in trouble. Looked, white and tall. Covered in white and tall is what I saw. All of them in a rush, they scattered. I mean scattered. I mean at one point, things were fine. We, we were colouring, following the teacher's instructions, laughing. Then bang! I heard, we heard, I heard bangs. We were not deaf. And the teachers, they, they were scared because that fear, do you see that fear? It's like I could taste it. We were stuck and they were as clueless as us, these gods in our eyes. And then it hits me. My friend in tears as this big, tall, dressed in white being lugs him away on his big, tall shoulder. Bags covering the heads of these children as if they were slaves taken from their homes. Dragged by their feet, fingers crawling memories into the sand. Held by the waist, their bodies dangling like dummies with eyes that blurred as it filled. All they saw was darkness. Heaven death's grip amidst the havoc. All they felt was fear. Not yet old enough to understand faith, yet the reach out of their skin. Bone contorts its sockets, their lungs shrivel in as if life's vacuum sucks from behind. Then outwardly projects its last reserves for its presence. They are calling. I looked. I will not see them again. Now grown, thinking, probably that could have been me on the helm of their shoulders, promising never to misbehave again, and I can shout. Oh yes, I can shout, but soon can be silenced with a blade or a bullet upon any attempt to escape. But I'm here, in England, thinking he or she will be by my side had their life been spared. They could question its complexities, make mistakes, be great, hell, graduate. They will understand when I say, boy, we had it easy when young, and I was all tax recessions and conservatives in power, but they'll be alive to feel. These, these perpetrators feel. And, and lengthy prison sentences, discipline they seem to throw, yet inhabiting such nature merely hibernates the beast. To take a child's life is like ceasing breath. Such loss ruined in seconds. And on my land, they seem to move from folklore to riches, where the source of money is yet to spell, let alone read. So this one is for Madeline, now age 12, for April, then five. For Abiola, now 26, missing since 2006, went on a school trip and not been seen since. For Jerome Thomas, Armina Khan, Helen Waru, Husan Tran, for my classmates that never saw the sun break in his glory with birds that flew in the sky that never aged. For Alexandra slowly, for friends, family, those that shed tears, those that internalized agony yet breathed hope. For Andrew Gosden, for Arlene Arkinson missing since 94, and Ben Needham since 91, aged one. For the 200 plus Nigerian kills kidnapped in Chibok, FYI, it's now day 492. You see it hurts inside, like a wound refusing to heal, the gash in my heart still bleeds. For I do not know these people, but this could be my son. This could be my cousin. This could be your brother. This could be your sister. My half sisters live in Philadelphia. Out of my sight, far from my eye, but in the depths of my soul, as a faith so thick that it spreads from the curve of my toe to my hair follicles. And I pray to God these nightmares don't come to life. Let my spirit hover over them like clouds, guarding them from anything that comes their way. And to those not mentioned, you are in thoughts. And its prayers slowly steer you back home. All I can say is stay strong. All we can say is stay strong. Say stay strong. Say it. Say it louder. All we can say is stay strong. Keep it saying it. Keep on saying it. Keep on saying it. Keep on saying it. Wherever we are. Wherever you are. Wherever you are. Louder. 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 Keep it going. Wherever you are, the fight goes on. Keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going.
generating rhymes to engage the enlightened mind. Big up Greeds, everybody, Greeds. So yeah, check, you know, that's Greed's first performer of the evening. Check him out on Twitter, Facebook, etc. Uh, there's, you know, we're going to be we're carrying on here tonight. Lots of stuff happening on stage. Uh, you've got the exhibition going on around here. There's the bar over there. You know, there's plenty of things to do. Uh, but please stay here because uh, we're moving. Like I said, this is Greed's has opened us up for the migration section. Uh, we've got two fantastic campaigners, activists, uh, who are going to kick us off with that, uh, take us into that section, discussing migration in a sensible, human kind of way instead of the nonsense that you're reading all around you. So uh, please welcome to the stage Penny Wangari Jones and Tatiana Garavito. <laughs> contact we've just got a poem to read music is a weapon love is a weapon goodness of a heart is a weapon truth is a weapon justice is a weapon ambition is a weapon a word is a life-given weapon knowledge is a weapon weep and wind your weapon Inspired by Fela Kuti, this poem was written by um, a nice young lady that uh, is going through the asylum system when she was in detention centre at Yarlswood. And she said she did it to nurse herself and to keep going. Um, I would have wanted her to be, there, to be here tonight, but she couldn't because she has to go to, the, um, to sign on tomorrow morning. So unfortunately, I just took the poem and I said, I'll read it for you and I'll pass it on. This young lady was abandoned at quite a young age when her family left her country and she was left in the hands of relatives, neighbors, and she would pass from post to pillar. And whilst she was, this was happening, she was used, she was abused, she was, sexually abused and then whoever were doing it managed to traffic her into the country when they got her here this carried on she was locked away for six years so she landed as a 15 year old she was locked away for six years until the home office got hold of her and when they did she got put in detention She'd use poetry to nurse herself for quite a few years because it was the only way that she could express herself and talk about the things that she was feeling. So, and the reason why they det detained her is why didn't she hand herself in at the port of entry? This is a 15-year-old who did not understand the system, who hasn't got much control of her life at that time. She didn't know what was happening. And she's one of many, many young people, and old people actually, because I've met older as well, who've gone through the system and who will carry on getting tortured, having to relieve what they've gone through to prove who they are, to prove the cases that they're trying to bring forth. Um, UK system, or the UK, only takes about 1% of the world refugees, or the refugees in the world, about 50 million of them. This 86% of them actually end up going to neighboring countries, which are, I'd say, a developing world, a part of the developing country, so they haven't got that much going for themselves anyway. But my question or my worry is what goes on and what gets portrayed in the media. I wonder how much attention they get, this 1%, how much media coverage they get, how much negative um, comments that they get and in a conversation on day-to-day -day living. Um, and I use the UK system as a comparison because where I was born and bred in Kenya, um, I've seen little villages get, what well, I'd say the demographics of a village just change in a fortnight. And that's because of the wars that were going on in the countries like in Rwanda, in Burundi, in Sudan, in Somali. We didn't hear this, it's not always easy but you don't get the comments that you get, the com that you get here considering how much change and what wealth or poverty that there is in the countries where these people go to. And my, 
My view is the UK needs to, first of all, understand the connection between migration and the history and their role in places like slavery in colonizing the world. Thank you. And I think if they do that, then they'll be a bit more sympathetic. They'll understand where these people are coming over because of things that have been done, whether it's the inferior uh, complex, whether it's the tribal conflict that was started back then that is coming out now. So when they sit and portray people as migrants, a word that's now become really, really negative, when they portray people as migrants, it's almost like, and people like Cameron use the word like swarm, it's, they just dehumanize the people that are coming through. So saying that, um, the topic today or the theme today was supposed to be utopia. And I started off by asking, hang on, what is utopia? What is my utopia? What is your utopia? And I'd say, is it, I don't know, is it something like, um, you know, better job? World peace, as we all kind of tend to say. Is it more sex? Better partners? It's something as basic as that. And it's not to make it look small. It's almost to think, what if the person sitting next to you holds the key to your utopia? How would you feel? How would you approach them? What would you want them to see? How would you want to reach out to them to let go of this little thing that we call utopia? Because that would mean the difference between where you are and where you, you want to be. Um, I've got a million and one stories and I'll probably talk for two days if I carry on in terms of experiences and the people I've come through. But I thought I'd just use this lady's example. Her utopia is to be treated as a human and with dignity. Her friends, thank you, her friends' utopia is to have a night out. Just think of that, to have a night out. She's got a tag. She's got a curfew. She hasn't committed any crime. She hasn't done anything to anybody. She's a migrant, so she's got a tag. She can't wear short dresses. She can't wear shorts. She can't go for a meal with a partner that she's met because she's got to be in at seven o'clock in the evening. And these are the realities that are out there. So my utopia, I started by thinking, actually, why am I doing what I do? I work as a, um, on racial justice matters, on race equality and on social justice issues uh, in Leeds, West Yorkshire, and covering Bradford and Keithley as well. And I started by asking myself, what would make me happy? First of all, probably the anger and the angst that I get from stories I hear would probably would be good. I'd have a good night's sleep, for starters. Uh, but also, my utopia would mean people wouldn't see one another as different. We'd all be humans before we, uh, whatever race or creed we come from, we'd be humans before anything else. I started doing the work that I do because of my own experiences in the UK or the British system. And that led me on to finding out more things and fighting and fighting and fighting. And I'm still fighting now, but I'm fighting a different battle. But what I'd like, or the battle I'm fighting, is because racism exists. It's here. And I think the, the fact that we've almost been forced as a black community to censor ourselves and not use the R word. You know, racism isn't just when people are using the N word. It's there, but it's subtle. And I think it's, it, it makes us more angry because it's subtle. You don't have these signs on the doors anymore, but some of the experiences that we have are no different. So for me, I pushed on and, I, and I'm thinking what would make me happy is if people challenge, people use their weapons to challenge the unjust laws where it's all right for me to say no to somebody who's ringing up because they're suffering from domestic abuse and say, you have no recourse to funding, I'm sorry, we can't help you. That coming, I see the funds, the money, the material things come before the human being. So laws like that where people are having to turn, get turned back from where they go to, to get some help with the GPs. People are destitute, they're not allowed to work, and at the same time, it's illegal to work and they're not getting any money. So they're being left out there, they're getting abused left, right and centre. So my utopia will be people challenging, 
people like us challenging the system? Where are the forefront? Where are they here checking people's IDs? Where are the ones saying, oh, you know, are you allowed to work? People like us challenging that system. My utopia will be us pushing on to the people that are leading us, the politicians. I say racism is there because all you need to do is look around, the police, the education system, um, the NHS. All of these systems are there and they're abusing somebody and just because it's not you doesn't mean somebody else is not suffering. And what I'd ask is, say when we see people, you know, dying in the Mediterranean, how does that make you feel? How would you feel if that was somebody you know, if that was a relative, if that was a I'd say a neighbor, would, does, does that feel different? If it does feel different, that means we, we have got to a stage where the system has push, pushed us to a state where we see people as different from ourselves and therefore it's all right to let them suffer. It's all right to build walls up and not allow them in. It's all right to even suggest to get the army out instead of actually seeing why are these people coming across? Is this their utopia? The fact that they're running away from wars, from conflicts, they've lost every member of their family to get across. And I think on, a, on an ending note is I'd ask people, not everybody is able to go and kick off and shout and demonstrate, but we've all got something, we've all got a weapon. People like the lady who wrote this poem wouldn't have to be dehumanized again, but she'd be able to see somebody across the room who's able to understand what she's going through. So use your weapons, that's what I ask. If you've got a weapon, because we've all got one, use your weapon. It might be something really small, but it's calling things out, calling the, the messaging out, and that would make the world a better place. That would be my utopia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Penny, for, for sharing that with, with us. Uh, my name is Tatiana, and uh, we've been invited here to talk about migrant rights because that's the work that we are doing. But for Utopia, I thought I would like to invite a group of people that I've been working with uh, for some time. Um, and the reason being is because for us, Utopia will have to be, our ideal Utopia will have to be led by women of color who've been systematically um, oppressed and discriminated and killed throughout history. Um, so I would like to welcome the London Latins, which is a group of people uh, that I've been working with and that I'm also part of. So there's Rosanna, <laughs> Melissa, and Ijari. And so the London Latins is a group of, wow, we can't see anything, <laughs> of organizers and activists uh, that realize that our communities have been disfranchised for far too long. And uh, we are working so that we can build together a social fabric so that we can confront all the different issues that we have in our societies. Um, the X of the Latins represents all the different genders and the fluid uh, sort of identities that we have within our group, within our own communities. And the X also remind us that uh, we also have to talk about and, and be very cautious of our privilege and, and, and power within our own groups and within our, uh, and our communities. Um, so the London Latins has been working around what we just started very, um, just a few months ago, but we've been working mainly around immigration um, issues because of the very toxic rhetoric that uh, we've experiencing that we can see every day as we come out of you know everywhere in the media and everywhere uh, and that is breaking apart our, our communities uh, we also chose uh, and be, uh, have been working around immigration because of uh, the crisis that we're living we have hundreds of women and people in detention illegally detained just and for being migrants and for being asylum seekers. So we are criminalizing migrants in this country. And we're also facing a, um, a crisis because we see every day how more than 4,000 people uh, are there in the so-called borders with France dying and we're ignoring their experiences, experiences and what their um, and, and the reasons why they they, they, they are having to migrate and and, and seek for, for asylum in this country. Um, so as 
the London Latins, we've been organizing a music festival to Calais. Um, and so we'll be transforming Calais and what they've called the, the jungle uh, in October. And we'll be taking music and arts so that we can honor the experiences and the struggles and resistance of people in Calais. So if you want to find out more about the work that we're doing, I know that there are many groups that are working around solidarity actions in Calais, but if you want to know more about the work that we're doing with this music festival in October, please do follow us uh, on Facebook. We have different fundraisers also in the next uh, weeks. Um, so just finally, we're going to share with you a poem that was written by Rosanna here and directed by Nusha, who is somewhere in the... Um, in the in the audience it's called the wall and i hope you get some inspiration uh, from this poem um, and that we stop or we sort of erase these borders that we have in our minds it's called the wall and i hope you enjoy it A wall will build, 10 foot tall, with spikes and lies and tails and spells. It'll keep them out, the dirty ones, the cockroaches, the ones who smell. A tail will spin, a web of lies constructed with the blood and bodies of the brown and black and yellow ones. Drowning, dying, choking, crying, trying, trying and trying and trying and trying. Never stopping till they reach the top of the virtual, physical, psychological wall. wall. We've built on our shores, on other, other shores. shores, in our minds, in our hearts, in our heads, and most destructively of all, in, in our, our souls. souls. The wall we've built hasn't kept our enemies outside our land, it has trapped them in. Odio, fear, rabia, jealousy, envidia have been confused as one inside ourselves so we no longer recognize our own lies from the truth, the facts, from the figures, the figures, from the daily male violence we suffer not because they took our jobs. No. no. We became insular and like a parasite we have allowed our rage feed off our pure, pure blood. blood. Our white blood cells thought they were better than the rest. They said we, we can, can fight off any foreign body without realizing the infection was the white blood. Cells and jails and prison walls kept our friends. Kept the ones who would tell us the truth from reaching our shores and shaking our hands and discovering that this land grew great because they had stolen from the brown and black lands. They came not even to take it back, to say, hey, hey, this is mine. After all this time, you force us to mine for your diamonds and gold and silver and coal. No. no, the ones you hate came over to work once again under minimum wage. To be abused and scarred and raped. Once again, slaves under a system of wage. But you kept the love out, and you kept the hate in. And, and you, you die, die, you die, you die! A thousand times until the walls come crashing down through the power and love and a rage that does not obsess over hate, that feels the fire in our hands, that we pass on through the gates, through the borders, through the wires, throughout the times, and releases the screws, the fences, the legal borders, borders of, of our, our minds. Solidarity and care. And love. Amor. More and more love took down these walls. Now we live as we once did, walking through the lines of old, rich, white men drew on their maps from their high-class classical classrooms of colonialism. Now, now we stand together. And now we give back people what they were due. And, and now, now the Jews are repaid. We feel the Jew at sunrise underneath our feet as our children, daughters, and sons rise. Now, now their hands are joined together. And as we have said, time and time and time again. Now there is justice. We, we can, can live in a world that, that is in one, one piece. piece. Peace. Peace. They're fantastic. Okay, so we've just told you that everybody is welcome here. You are all welcome here in this space. And this space is not just what's happening on the stage, this space is also the exhibition. And because we don't want you to like desiccate, it's also the bar. So please do feel free to move around and drink and see things and talk to each other. Because this is not just a polemic discussion. It's not just us telling you what we think, it's you telling each other what you think. 
So that means write on those bits of paper. People are going to be coming around and picking them up from you in a minute. Okay? So there's a big question that I'm going to maybe you're all asking yourselves is who brought you here? Why are you all here and why is this night happening? Yes, the exhibition is happening. Yes, Block 9 and Penny Walcott put it together. But also there's a very fantastic and amazing um, social group called Compass who made the decision to put this night on. So please, can you give it up from Joe and Jackie from Compass? Wow, uh, it's incredible to see so many of you here. Um, it's really humbling and really exciting. Um, firstly, we'd like to thank Penny Walcock, uh, the curator of this exhibition, and the Round House as well, for inviting us to put on this evening. At Compass, we call our utopia a good society, a more equal, sustainable, and democratic society where people on the planet thrive. So tonight is about all of us imagining that utopia, that good society together. And it's also about creating that roadmap that takes us from the dystopia that Penny has so wonderfully created in the installation to the good society. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being here. Um, thanks, Joe. Um, so I'm going to say something about the politics of love because when I think of what motivates me to get up every morning and to work at Compass and to try and make the world a better place, that thing is love. And by love, I don't mean nice, sentimental, Hollywood romantic love. I mean a love that is based on trust and respect and truth and knowledge and empathy and caring and responsibility for each other and for our planet. And when we think of politics, we think of Westminster and something that's done to us, something that's undemocratic and elite and disconnected. And when I think of what politics should be like, it should be about love. We should start from a place of respect and responsibility and trust and empathy. And if we imagine the world we could create, if we started everything we did from that place, the kind of policies we could create, the kind of societies we could create, that's my utopia. And for Compass, that's the point where we start our work as well. So I just want to say a huge thank you to all the speakers and performers for coming today, for being part of this, and to all of you for coming. And I hope you have a really great night. from Compass who brought you all here tonight. Um, can we have another round of applause for them, please? <laughs> Woo! So Jackie said what's bringing us all together is an idea of utopia and, um, and what she thinks about a utopia is love. Um, who here in this room feels loved? The Roundhouse, you are not loved at all. Who in this room feels trusted? Wow, that's even worse. Who in this room feels like an agent of change? Well, that's amazing. You are unloved, untrustworthy people, but you are agents of change, which is positive. So at some point in the near future, hopefully you will be loved and trusted. Um, so we're moving on to the next bit of the evening. We've uh, set out a proposition. Everyone is welcome here. And we've welcomed you here into this space. You are welcome. And now we're going to ask about whether people are really welcome in this place and what it, we have to do to change. What do we have to do to change? Um, I really think that this, we're at the point of an exciting cusp, in, um, well, terrifying and exciting cusp, at least in my lifetime. I've never known things to be quite so uncertain. But that means that things don't have to always be this way. There's a line in a poem that I really like by a poet called Derek Brown. And it goes, teased by success, we are like vampires in a tampon factory. It doesn't have to be this way. And I feel as if that's where we are right now. Sam? 
Yeah, so we got some, uh, so for this panel discussion, we're thinking big, we're thinking about the fact that there's a global world experiencing austerity, uh, and we're trying to think about narratives against that. Uh, and what's been really exciting for Europe is that change is coming into Europe right now. Uh, and I, th I think that what Tsaritsa have done in Greece has really started the spark of something. And it's interesting, isn't it, that when you come out and you do something different from the accepted way, you, then you see just how democratic the institutions are that claim towards democracy. And we'd never see that here in the UK, would we, Sam? No, not at all. Never, sure. never so, see that in the UK. So, Yanis Varoufakis, the finance minister of Syriza, has reported that in a meeting of finance ministers where he said, listen, we've been elected, we've had a referendum that says we want to change this memorandum, we want to change what, he, uh, what you're doing here, uh, and he was told, by the German finance minister, elections change nothing. Which is a good little message for you when you, when you may fall for the facade of democracy. So we're gonna start with um, a London representative of, uh, of Syriza. Uh, so please welcome Marina Prentoulis. Hello. Well, I'm not very keen on Varoufakis. I'm not very keen on narcissistic men that they talk too much. So, well, okay. I also have to say he doesn't belong to the party. So, again, I don't know. He's an academic as well, so, okay. I have my question marks, but I don't want to talk about him. Uh, I want to talk about utopias and to welcome you to this neoliberal utopia that us, most of all, Greeks know it's going really, really well as a dystopia. As a dystopia, it's doing fine. So there is more inequality, there is more distraction, environmental distraction as well, more people unemployed, and it goes on like that. Greece is one of the nations that they have suffered more. They have also been stripped of their dignity during these negotiations, as a lot of you know. So as we live in this very dystopian vision of the world, a neoliberal vision where there is no way out, what is the point of talking about utopias? And I was always very fond of utopias. I was very fond of utopias and I had a lot of friends that they were involved in utopian studies, creating intentional communities, trying out different experiments of utopias. But most of this, I mean, one example could be the kibbutz in Israel, other intentional communities that we had in Britain, eco-friendly and so on. But they were all quite small. They didn't change that much, apart from the people, the small number of people that they were participating in them. So the question is, what is the point of these utopias, literary or actual uh, communities that they are based on utopian ideas? And for me, the answer was always one. Utopias, this type of utopias are great because they educate our desire, our desire to want more, to try more, and in politics, to try for change. So for me, this is what utopias are all about, educating our desire. But desire doesn't come to an end. If, I mean, no one of us, if you stop desiring, this will be our death. This is why some of us, we go from lover to lover, and we are trying to find this ideal that never happens at the end. But desire is what makes us human, what keeps us alive, and it makes us strive more and more all the time. I believe the same about political utopias. They educate our desire for change. It's not about the blueprint of the perfect society, because you know, and we all know, that utopia is never going to happen. It's not existent, it's not about the blueprint. It's about this journey, trying to get there. If we were to get there to the perfect political society, it will be our political death. We need to go and we need to go on all the time. Now, you may wonder, how is this related with Syriza? How is this related with Greece? As you know, these days we've been accused for 
losing for not managing to deliver our program, not stopping austerity in Greece and for a lot of other countries, not stopping neoliberal, neoliberalism and capitalism for all of you. Sorry about that, but we gave it a go. <laughs> But the question is, what was and what is the significance of Syriza? You know that Syriza is a coalition of radical left organizations that they came together in 2004 and they created Syriza. This is already a big thing if you belong to the left. What the left does better is divide and bitch about each other. So already bringing them together, it was a big thing. There is smoke everywhere. Is something happening? <laughs> but Syriza wasn't the main story for Greece. It was the movements, the diverse movements that they came out, the people, different groups of people, that they came out in the streets and they said, we have, we had enough. We don't want this political establishment anymore. We want an alternative. This was the movement of the indignados. We had the equivalent in Spain, and Syria is going to talk about that. So first, we had the movement, the people that occupied the squares, and then Syriza, who took on some of the demands of the movements. And then, when we won and we became the first left government in Europe, the negotiation started. And they lasted for six months. In between, you must have heard we had a referendum and the Greek people again voted no to the proposals of the European Union, the Eurozone partners. <clears throat> and we tried again and we tried to create a different deal and through that a different future for Europe. But what happened on the July 12th is that we all realized that we were too naive. The Europe that or the Eurozone partners that we had in front of us, they didn't give a shit about solidarity. They didn't give a shit about unity. They didn't give a shit about social justice. And this was a big thing, a big slap on our face, and I think everybody's face. And we had to accept the deal, and we were defeated. And this is how we see it. We were defeated. But for some of us, for some of us that we like utopias and we see a process of always trying to achieve something that it will never happen, this defeat is a new opening. Through that, we saw what the neoliberal Eurozone and European Union that we have is. And now, through this opening, we call everybody to join in across Europe and have a movement which is going to change this situation. So, you know, the old... I, I have more problems that I wanted to talk about with the old left, for example, because they are the ones that they have a very good blueprint. They will bring the communist society on any time soon. But their vision is not about politics. It's a blueprint which, for me, it's the death of politics. This is why I don't accept their accusations for defeat, because what they have in their mind is a blueprint which will never happen, which does not allow dialogue in terms of politics, which does not allow us to talk to each other, find ways to organize and do something bigger. I think somewhere here I have to stop. I'll be around if you want to have a drink and go on about the old left and so on. I'm, I'm going to finish. I just want to say the final thing. I don't feel defeated. I feel that we have a new opening, and this is what we are going to go on trying to achieve through parties, but also through movements. Thank you. Marina Prentunis! 
It's definitely sparked up a lot of questions in my mind. Don't worry, you do have an opportunity to ask some questions at the end of this session. But first of all, I'm going to bring up to the stage um, a member of the London Circle of Spain's absolutely groundbreaking Podemos party. What does Podemos mean? It means we can. We can, and this party has a real chance of actually getting into government in Spain. So please, put your hands together for Silio Canos! Woo! Good evening. Um, I have to admit, I've never been too keen on the notion of utopia. Utopia has always felt like something I couldn't quite relate to. They felt like big and abstract and, and flawless. But by this, I don't mean I've, I don't believe there's a possibility of building a better world. Of course, and of course there is. And, and in fact, throughout my life, I've always, I've always been part of one movement or other trying to fight or campaign for something. But all these projects had in common that they recognized the world as it was with its good things and its flaws and its limitations and took those ingredients and tried to build something better. Not perfect, but better. And by this I don't mean that we should just, in order to build a better world, aim low and small. You can definitely dream big, but what I, the important thing is that you take those dreams seriously. And that is what I've been, throughout my life, trying to do from different movements and platforms. But something I never thought I would do was to join a political party. And yet here I am, standing tonight, as a member of one. Still feels a bit weird to say it loud. But so I would like to explain why I've changed my mind in that respect. And this has to do with the situation in Spain. Since 2011, we've had major social movements that started with the Indignados, which Marina was just mentioning. And the Indignados were a bit like Occupy, but bigger and more diverse, and Paul showed how over 70% of the Spanish population backed them. And then they evolved into a multiplicity of social movements, from doctors occupying hospitals to stop the privatization, to families stopping their neighbor's eviction. And for a while it felt like everybody was on the streets fighting for a better society. And then that same year, we had general elections. And the Conservatives, which were the party that had been spearheading the cuts, as well as the one involved in most corruption scandals, won. And they didn't just win, they won by an overwhelming absolute majority. And you can imagine how depressing this was, and how many of us just felt like retreating into the comfort of cynicism and saying, well, we tried. But then, when you took a step back and thought about it, it actually made sense. Because the reason why the anger on the squares wasn't finding its way into the ballot boxes was because it had nothing it could get translated into. The two main parties were, they decided they could just ignore what was going on the squares, and the smaller ones were too, fight, too busy fighting each other to even notice what was going on. So we got this new government and it launched a horrible package of cuts and um, just anti-social measures essentially that caused great social and humanitarian distress. So from this we learn two things. First of all, that it doesn't matter how much you shout from below if there isn't anybody at the top willing to listen. And by this I don't mean that social movements are not important. On the contrary, they're crucial and we need them now more than ever, but they're not enough. The second thing we realize is that we were not living in a democracy for the simple reason that if politics can ignore society and get away with it, there is no real democracy. If, if all the major decisions that shape our lives are taken far before we even go to vote, and all we get to choose is the phase that will implement austerity, there can be no democracy. And we realize that our institutions have been in fact hijacked by a privileged minority, uh, and that politicians had stopped being messengers of common people as they should be and had become the butlers of the region privilege and it was for them that they were governing in order to change this therefore it wasn't enough to just organize protests and demonstrations we needed a political tool a political tool capable of taking back the institutions and putting back in the service of people where they should have been and they still had to be able to learn from the lessons of the social movements and made democracy participation and transparency 
one uh, the, the key pillars reflected in every level of the organization but also to be effective and capable of fighting and winning battles in a very tilted terrain with all the power and the resources were on the other side and that's what podemos is podemos was created in january 2014 and in three months of in that tiny entirely crowdfunded budget got five meps in the european election it then tripled its support in the regional election and for the local elections last May uh, it joined a series of independent citizen platforms that ran for the councils and not only ran but won the most important councils in Spain, at least the biggest cities, Madrid, Barcelona and many others. And these councils have shown that these are not just words, that when we say that change is possible it can be done that all this chance we've You've been hearing over the years of there is no alternative. It's rubbish. There is an alternative. It's just a matter of political will. These councils, in the two months since they got elected, they've done more than previous councils in years. Even with all the um, problems that are being put by the national administration, they've managed to stop thousands of evictions where families had no housing alternative. They've made sure that no children was left without two meals a day over the summer when dining halls in schools are closed. They've uh, invested a lot and social housing and social policies. They've opened internet platforms where citizens can submit proposals that then get the backing and funding of councils. And, and this is just a few things. And not only that, but they've done, done that while saving money because these councils are far more efficient than the previous ones were because they are better managers, but also because they've been cutting on all the outrageous privileges that the previous councils had. The next step now, however, is the national government because without taking back the government for the people there's very there's limits to what can be done at the local or regional ones luckily we have okay i'll finish in a minute we have elections at the end of the year and we'll be able to do that i'd like to finish by saying that this is what's happening in spain but i see this happening across europe as well it might take different forms depending on the country and the region but this spirit of grassroots demand for democracy of a new type of politics that has the common will at the center of everything it does is all over the place i saw it in some of the debates in scotland about the referendum i see it here in corbyn's campaign and the hope and excitement is generated i see it in greece as well and as marina was saying i i think I agree that the most recent chapter in Greece's story, it is partly a defeat. But bear this in mind, if a tiny country, economically speaking, a country that's only 2% of Europe's GDP, managed to create such an earthquake, an earthquake that forced the mighty European elites to drop any pretense of remotely caring about democracy or human rights, something that's going to greatly damage the possibility of influencing things in the future. If a tiny country managed that, imagine if a mighty economic power like the UK or medium one like Spain also tried. We could definitely build a better, more democratic and social Europe, a Europe that we need now more than ever. So, <laughs> just to finish, I might not believe in utopias, but as you can probably uh, see, I'm quite excited about the future because I see all these people in Spain and across Europe suddenly realizing that there is an alternative and that we can make it happen, and that is far more exciting than any utopia will ever be. Thank you. Thank you, Sirio. So I, th I think what's great is that, you know, despite the fact that your media does not present to you, your, your sort of official media doesn't present to you stories, we're starting to get an international perspective. So, and I'm hoping all of you are listening to that, thinking about what it means to you in Britain, what we can learn from that. Because, you know, I'm not a big fan of the internet's going to bring about the revolution kind of stuff, but we do have the possibility of learning from international movements. And that's just two, that's just Greece and Spain. We could have been talking about Rojava, we could have been talking about movements across the world. Yeah? So I think, you know, we, we should be thankful for the international perspectives that we're getting that we can bring back to what we are having here. So I'll give it up again for Syria. And the last person in this section, I'm sure a lot of you do know who he is. Uh, it was, it, to me, I'm just thinking back to when sort of the early 2000s and, uh, you know, they were doing um, 
They're, they're basically, as you may be aware, they kind of started attacking the poor. It's no longer acceptable. We found new acceptable ways to be rude about poor and working class people, and they found ever more ways of doing it. Uh, I remember one column in one newspaper column had a chav of the week column, uh, which is uh, unbelievable. And and yet, you know, there was a guy who came forward. This guy came forward and talks about what we rightly term the demonisation of the working class. And despite the own demonisation that he's received in the media, has been bravely putting forward an alternative viewpoint in mainstream press and on TV. Uh, so we're going to invite him to speak. Welcome, please, Owen Jones. Uh, it's great to be here. I, I agreed to do this um, a few months ago and I thought, ah, August, nothing much happens in politics in August. <laughs> Whoops. Um, but, uh, it, it's fantastic to be here and it's fantastic to be with international speakers and this is why, because the problems and injustices, I don't know what the smoke's all about, this is weird. This is going to fall on top of me, isn't it, at any moment. Um, because the problems and injustices we face are never going to be overcome in just one country alone. We've got to build these international alliances because the problems and the injustices that we face, they differ in scale and in specifics in each country. But there are a lot of common features. And unless we build those alliances with people in Madrid and Barcelona and in Athens and in Berlin and in Paris and in Rome, and across the whole European continent, we will never change the way things are here. We've got to build that broad coalition, so it's great to be here with those speakers. Now, I want to talk partly about uh, the politics of hope, and what I want to explain what I mean by that. Because hope sounds sometimes a bit of a, an empty platitude, I suppose. And that's not how I see it. All hope means is that the problems and injustices that we face are temporary and transient, and can be overcome with enough determination and resilience and commitment. The politics of despair want us to believe that the problems and the injustices we face are a bit like the weather. The weather is pretty rubbish out there. I normally cycle, but it was raining. And we, we're normally told that, you know, injustice is a bit like the weather. You can complain about it raining, but there's nothing you can do about it. It's just the way the world is. You've got to grit your teeth. You've got to take the blows. That's just the way life is. It's tough. It sucks. But the politics of hope says otherwise, that the problems we face can be overcome. And I think about this city. I love this city. You know, I'm a plastic northerner now. My accent fades with every single day. But this city brings together people from Sudan and Sri Lanka and Stockport. And, you know, we live together and work together. In some cases, we sleep together. But this is a wealthy, booming capital city where Oligarchs snap up new build properties in the center and leave them vacant, whilst one in four young people grow up in an overcrowded home. Their health, their education, their well-being all damaged as a consequence. We've gone through the longest fall in workers' pay packets since Queen Victoria sat on the throne, whilst the wealth of the richest 1,000 people has doubled. During the, one of the great economic traumas in the history of this nation, we live in a country where the banks can be bailed out after plunging the country into economic disaster. They weren't bailed out by free market dogma. They were bailed out by the state. They became the most lavished benefit claimant in Britain. But with one key difference, the thing about these banks is they could carry on much as they ever did. Not lending to small businesses, paying record bonuses with this government taking the EU to court to stop them uh, imposing any, link, uh, any limits on those bonuses, where they pay more bonuses than every European Union country put together. Whilst at the same time, people at the bottom of society, their, their state support, their pathetic, measly, derisory state support can be stopped for the most pathetic reasons. Say, you're an army veteran called Stephen Taylor, 60 years old in Manchester. And this 60-year-old man was a, he was desperately looking for work, and if you're 60 years old and out of work, it's tough, it's hard. But he was trying, and he was selling poppies for the Royal Legion, selling poppies for maimed and injured former comrades of his. And he was doing his best to get work, but he, he was selling these poppies at a supermarket where he applied for work, he didn't get work. He had his benefits stopped for four weeks on the basis his volunteering for the Royal Legion 
showed he wasn't trying hard enough to look for work. This is a society we live in, where if you're at the top of society, the banks, the state will come rushing to save you, even after you plunge the country into economic disaster, and you can carry on much as you ever did. But if you're at the bottom of society, if you're suffering the consequences of the behavior of these people, then that state support will be stripped away for the most arbitrary reasons. And that is socialism for the rich, and it's capitalism for the poor. It's a society where most people in work, sorry, most people in poverty, most people in poverty are in work and they get up every day and they, they earn their poverty day after day. Where since this government came to power, over a million workers have been plunged into poverty pay disproportionately women. We could go on with these injustices. The young people who wake up every single morning with text messages telling them if they're going to get work that day. Where they have no security, no pensions, forget about that. No paid sick leave. A return to a supposedly bygone era where dock workers marched to the yard and stuck their hands up hoping to get work, often to go home disappointed. It doesn't have to be like this. This is the sixth richest country on the face of the earth and we're supposed to tolerate the fact that a million of our fellow citizens are driven to food banks, deprived of that basic human need to eat. In 2015, in Britain, where the Red Cross, for the first time since the end of World War II and the overthrow of Adolf Hitler, the Red Cross are giving food packages to the people in this country who can't afford to feed themselves. It doesn't have to be like this. It's not just unjust, it's irrational. It doesn't make any sense. And that's why I think when things seem tough and hard and difficult, I look at the example of our ancestors. I think of the Chartists who fought for democracy in the 19th century. I think of the early trade unionists who fought for the rights of working people and their dignity. I think of the suffragettes who now we all laud, they're secular saints, but in their time they were hated and reviled. They were terrorists and anarchists. They were locked up in prisons and they were force fed. I think of people who fought for the welfare state and the NHS in the teeth of determined opposition from the powerful. Those who fought racism and sexism and homophobia, who were spat at in the streets and battened by police officers. And the thing we always have to remember is we stand on the shoulders of giants, that everything we have, all our rights and our freedoms were won, not because the people at the top woke up one day and thought, oh, I'm feeling generous, I'll give people some rights. People had to fight for them. And now I look at the way things are today and the lack of, and the one thing lacking, that lack of hope. And when hope is missing, people become resigned. And not just resign, that anger is turned on their neighbours. That people who are low paid are expected to turn on the unemployed. That people who are private sector workers are expected to turn on public sector workers. That people already living here are expected to turn on immigrants. And the basis is always the politics of envy. They have what they shouldn't have when you're struggling. And the whole point of that is, it's this politics where you say to people, you know, you've been robbed, but don't be angry at the fact you're being robbed. Be angry a less deserving neighbour hasn't been robbed quite as much as you have. But what gives me hope, and this is what I want to wrap up with. Something's changed in the last couple of months. I've known this guy called Jeremy Corbyn for a couple of years now. Now, the thing about Jeremy Corbyn is he's a man of principle and courage and determination. And also the four times winner of Beard of the Year, which they don't just hand out to anyone. And he stood against apartheid when our government were calling the ANC terrorists. He stood for LGBT rights when to do so was seen as loony left. He said that when we were arming Saddam Hussein as he bombed and gassed the Kurds, he was campaigning against it. He stood for peace and negotiations in Northern Ireland when to do so was to be seen as extreme. He's always been on the right side of history. And he's out there now. And the whole point about Jeremy Corbyn is he never says, you, if you ever listen to him speak, he never says I, he always says we. Not because he's become a megalomaniac and he started talking about the royal we, but because he sees this as a movement, a collective movement. And what he's done since the last couple of months, this extraordinary grassroots movement has emerged. And this genie is not going back in any lamp. And the whole point of it is if you believe in genuine change, we've all got to be part of it. Because however bad the smears are now, 
is going to be like nothing as the smears that will come if he wins as leader on September the 12th. So this is my plea. If you believe, if you believe that this society is fundamentally bankrupt, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for the vast majority of people. If you want genuine social change, if you've already joined as a Labour member of support and you've put a cross next to Jamie Corbyn, brilliant. But please, and this is what I beg you, things are going to get ugly and messy if he wins. And even if he doesn't win, We've got to build this grassroots movement from below to change this country. So let's all make a vow. If we want to change this country and fight for something different, commit to being part of this grassroots movement, a grassroots movement in a great tradition in this country of people fighting for justice. In the next few weeks, we'll see what happens. But on September the 12th, whatever is decided, and if you want change, be part of this grassroots movement. Let's build it from below. Let's stand in the best traditions of our ancestors. Let's have hope. Let's realize these problems can be overcome. And let's finally change this country forever. Thank you. Stay up, stay up, stay up, stay up, stay up, stay up, stay up. Marina. So that was, that was Owen Jones, everybody. Uh, so we're, we're going to have a very, very short little discussion here, because uh, I'm going to be very long. But one thing you've got in front of you, remember, is the post-it notes. Those who weren't here at the front, at the start, what we're looking for is Thank what you. you would do on your day in Anyone Utopia. What kind of things would you do? Write them down, put them there. We're going to make a poem out of them. But uh, we're going to have like one or two questions. I'm going to kick it off by asking my panel one question. Uh, and then you guys, we're going to get... I'm sorry, your democracy has been curtailed uh, and we do not have time to hear your opinion. Uh, but we'll get a little bit while we have time. So uh, my first question, because you brought up the JC word, you brought up the first time Corbyn was mentioned tonight. Uh, and we're thinking about... And some people here uh, who are quite left-wing will say, oh, we can't vote for Corbyn because if Corbyn gets in, it will, he'll be destroyed in the media, he'll be savaged, uh, the Labour Party will split. Uh, and for sort of pragmatic reasons, we can't really have a left-wing change. So why should he reply about Corbyn and not me? I'm, not, I'm, I'm really an internationalist. I, I'm not just asking. You didn't mention Corbyn. That's all, that's all I'm saying, right? You know, if you want to make... Anyway, uh, we'll get into an argument later. So my question is, how much do we have to think pragmatically when we move politically? And how much do we go with utopian ideals? And that question is to all of you. So whoever wants to go first. Go I, I was joking, yeah? Okay, good. I won't have to actually have a fight with you. Right. Well, just quickly, I, look, I don't believe in utopia. I think believing in a, a socially just society running the interests of the vast majority is quite a pragmatic thing to believe in. I believe the Thatcherites, they were utopians. They wanted to impose a sort of society which is bankrupt and doesn't work. I think we're the realists. With the realists, we just want a society that's democratically running the interests of the majority. But all I'd say is, most people do not think in terms of left or right. They think in terms of issues to be addressed, in a way that resonates with them, that answers their everyday problems and concerns. And the polling, the polling shows actually Jamie Corbyn's way ahead, not just amongst Labour voters, which he is, but UKIP voters, or often working class people who lack hope and need their everyday issues from housing and jobs and wages and services answered. SNP voters, and crucially, people not voting. He's got support across the generations, but is it a surprise he's mobilizing young people whose futures are being eaten away by the housing crisis, the lack of secure jobs, the fall in living standards, and the attack on services? I don't think it is. And what we have to do with this campaign from below is reach out to people who did not vote, people who voted SNP, people who voted UKIP, people who voted Green, and build a broad majority to mobilize people who've given up on politics and former politics altogether. I don't see how any of the under candidates can possibly achieve that, but it is up to all of us, because as I say, it will be the biggest media smear campaign probably in the history of the democracy in this country, and unless we build a grassroots movement, which we're all part of, then it will lose. But if we're all part of it, and we build that movement from below, we'll we change things. Right. Uh, what do you reckon? Okay, shall I go? Um, yeah. Is this working? There's not, not oh, working. Hold this. Hold this. Okay. I go. Uh, so I completely agree on the on the issue of um, 
Oh, exactly what um, Owen was saying. And on the issue of right and left, in Spain, this is something we talked about a lot because while this might be valid analytical categories, to most people, they've stopped meaning much. They're a bit like football teams almost. You're born into one and you stay into that one. But in terms of consent, when you have the Socialist Party voting pro TTIP in Europe and you have traditional conservatives who just believe that institutions should work for the people they supposedly represent, Two things get very blurry. So in Podemos, we found it easier to talk about concepts, to talk about things rather than about labels, because we think this sort of labels divide. And we are fighting against very, very mighty forces. So a unity of the left is not enough. We need a popular unity. We need people from across the political spectrum that agree on these fundamental things. And we need all these people. We need to, we need to avoid sectarianism. And that's something that has characterized the left for too long. We need to go beyond our traditional niche and talk to society as a whole, because that's the only way we'll be able to win and make a better society, Thank therefore. Thank you. So, what do you, what do you Marina, just left to you, do you think, can we be utopian in our methods or do we need to be pragmatic? Or well, is there somewhere in between? I, I mean, I'm going to reply with what you were saying about Corbyn, and I agree or sort of agree about left and right. I, I do like Corbyn a lot and I like the way he mobilized people. But there is something which I think you, you, you talk again about, which is about winning elections. And the Labour Party always had this thing about winning elections. And although this may be very important, it's not the only thing. So, so what we see with Corbyn is another 300,000 people that they are willing to change things, and these are the people, not only to keep them in the party and have them vote in the next election, but to keep them mobilized. And this will be the difficult experiment, to mobilize the people to have a true grassroots movement. Now, in terms of Corbyn, I think the fun and games will start after he becomes a leader of the party. I mean, I've never seen members of a party in my life having these long faces because they have 300,000 more me people interested in their party. I mean, how are you going to deal with them? I don't know. Amazing, yeah, it is amazing. Right, we're going to take is true democracy so of the 600 people who have come here we're going to take two questions because that's who that's kind of representative of how many people have a say in society so here we go okay adam hi uh yeah following up from that last point it's a question for owen if corbyn wins or if he loses it's possible that the labor party might split because everything's so polarized would you leave the labor party with him if that were to happen that's a very good question. My point has always been this. The only point of being involved or having support of some of my politics with the Labour Party is the trade union link. The fact that there's some link between a movement that represents millions of working people. If that link is severed, if the union's left, then of course I'd leave with them because there would be no Labour Party. But I would say this, I've come under quite a lot of stick over the last few years at some of my politics for saying there is a fight to be had in the Labour Party to change it. I'm not going to go all, oh, I told you so, but, but, <laughs> I do think in this country, in other countries, there's been a wave of discontent and it's, re it's manifested itself in different ways. I always thought it would come within the Labour Party in this country and that is what has happened. And it is important to remember that and why that's happened. And finally, I just want to make the point about electability, this debate that's had. Of course, we need to mobilise people and have active people. And, and, and that's the only way we'll win. But what's the point of a vision unless you can inspire enough people to elect a government that can change this country? And that's a really important point to have. And the point about electability isn't about capitulating to the underlying principles of your opponents. By any stretch, policies that devastate lives and jobs and services and people's futures, of course it isn't. It's about having an alternative that inspires people. But I'm never gonna give in to this idea of it's not about electability. Of course we've got to win. We've got to form a government to change people's lives. And the way of doing that is winning in, by building a community-led movement, people active in their communities, and getting people elected. And my position, as I say, on Labour is, this is brilliant, this movement that's emerged, but don't be complacent, be part of it, whether you're in the Labour Party or not. And if we do that, then we can build a party which I think 
can not just change people's communities, but actually become the government of this country and transform people's lives. And that's what it's all about. Okay. So, Owen Jones. Well, our last question. Uh, Owen, you're not allowed to speak anymore because you've done your speaking. So we're gonna, anyone's got a question for our two other guests here? What's your name? I haven't got a very good voice, I'm sorry. My name's Guppy. Um, what would be, what would people need to do in order to get the best outcome for the European referendum? Should we be voting yes or no? And what should we be doing beforehand? So what, the question is, what would, what's best to come out of the European referendum? Or do we want a yes or a no? Okay. Continental um, Europeans. The problem, I think, is that how the answers to this possible referendum stand either yes or no, they don't say much about the European Union that we have in front of us. As I said before, from the 12th of July, we are dealing with a very different situation. We saw a Eurozone on the one part, but a European Union on the other hand, that they are very neoliberal, very difficult to transform. So in my view, the, the position I will take is yes, but, and this but becomes bigger and bigger. So apart from saying yes, but, I will have to come up with different proposals of how we see this uh, happening in the future. What I can say is that it cannot be a neoliberal EU. It cannot be anymore because it's not going to be there for too long. There were different visions through the negotiations that we saw about the Eurozone and the European Union that they were very dystopian and they are going to destroy it anyway. So for me, it's yes, but, and I work on this but now. Okay. I support the yes, but as well entirely. And I think the, the whole Greek crisis did something very important, which was to expose all the cracks that exist within the current European Union. It, it, it demonstrated like the kind of hegemony that the neoliberal um, group had over the decisions has been broken, it's been exposed, it's very, very clear now. We all are aware, if anybody had any ideas that there was democracy inside the European Union at terms, in terms of its top institutions, now we no longer under that impression. But that, I think, shouldn't lead to skepticism or cynicism about it. It's the opposite. I really think in the same way that our, it, our national institutions had been hijacked, the European ones had been doubly hijacked, but we need to take them back because there's no ways we can fight the financial lobbies and all the other force and elected forces that essentially shape our communal laws without us electing them. So I think this has begun. There is a lot of a discrepancy between the different countries and this is not an economic matter, it's a political one, it's a matter of power. So if all Spain changes government, the story is going to be very different because you have the fourth economy, the Eurozone, arguing for a different Europe. If things change in Britain again, we are at the beginning of something and I think it's going to be really good. All right, we're going to end it there with really good, end this section. So uh, thank you very much to, to, uh, to our it? guests. What's that? Is that it? That's all you get, I'm afraid, Marina, enough. You have to, if you want to chat more with Marina, do yes. find her or any of our panellists and, and ask them some questions. Unfortunately, we only have a very short amount of time in this world to talk about utopia. So we're going to have to move on. So thank you very much to our panellists. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. Michelle's going to take you on from here. No. Well, that was, that was worth it, wasn't it? Um, well, I hope you do have things to say, and I hope you are fired up, and I hope you discuss with each other and talk to each other about what's going on. And we're moving on to the last bit of this evening now. Um, so, we've said everyone's welcome here. We've talked about politics and social change, and now we're going to come to this city, this London that we live in, and we're going to ask people about what it is to live in London right now. So first up, we have a fantastic, fantastic woman who is an organiser for Take Back the City. And they're all here! Are you here? Are you ready to take back the city? Take back the city! Amazing. Her name
name is Amina Gachinga. Please put your hands together for her right now. Woo! Hello, hello. Hi, hi. Thanks for sticking around. I thought that you'd all have gone to the bar by now. So <laughs> it's really nice to see some people still here. That's awesome. So yeah, my name's Amina Gachinga. I'm 25. Um, I am a community activist and a freelance musician. I work in schools across Newham, um, across London and Brixton as well. So, yeah, I, I have a love of London because I've lived here all my life. I'm born and bred Homerton, Manor Park, Stratford, Hackney Girl. Yes, so boom. Okay, so it's because I do a lot of community work that I feel like community work isn't prioritised um, in our society. Yeah, it is the key, surely it is the key, to us looking out for one another. And this is why I've been drawn in to Take Back the City, because this is an amazing, diverse, young group of people who really, really want to make a change to our city. And it's so important right now when we feel that everything's being taken away, gentrification is taking away our chance of having a home you know, being a public sector worker and, and living in my area is becoming, you know, it's, it's not going to be a reality anymore very soon. I've always felt that my relationship with, how can I say this? So, my relationship with British politics has been a bit rocky, okay? So, I've, I've done some work experience in Parliament. I've done an internship with Glenis Kinnock when I, I went to Goldsmiths. I had to write a food commodity report. I don't think she actually looked at it, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> and I just walked in there and I felt like, what the fuck, man? This is not for me, yeah? I just walked in and I was like, okay, all these old white men with wigs on the walls, yeah? Who, who are they to me? Or who am I supposed to be idolizing? Because everything that this education system has taught me is about monarchy and about feudalism, yeah? And that's not what I'm about, yeah? You don't even hear about the common man. Why is there not a common man all on them walls, in the House of Commons, in the House of Lords? That's my question, and this needs to be changed. We need representation. We need people of color. We need women on those walls. Transgender people in them wars, yeah? So, that's my experience of that. But then I started reflecting on my activist experience as well. My experience of going to groups, kind of thinking, oh, I really like this cause. I really like this issue and I really want to get involved. And experiencing that sense that it's elitist. Again, I'm faced with this problem that I can't engage with this because it is exclusive, yeah? It's why? Often, often it's white, it's changing, it's changing. It's white and it's middle class. And the language that is used is not accessible for me. Even though I went to university and it was the same in university, I went to seminars. And would you, I'm a gobby bitch, right? Okay, I'm here on this stage, yeah? And I'm speaking my mind. But in a seminar with like 20 other people, I couldn't say anything about these ideologies even though I disagreed and I was thinking oh my god yeah I this guy's gone to private school and he just knows everything about x topic yeah and I just thought I can't I can't speak my mind about that how is that so why is that anyway going back to take back the city I've I, I'm really drawn into it because it's a group that I've been working with for six months now and it's different it is a safe space to be able to talk about our politics, yeah? And we are starting to spread this out across London. So we're, what we're doing is we're doing people's manifesto workshops across London, um, which we'd love all of you to be engaged in as well. Um, so what we're doing is we're giving a platform to people who don't usually vote, yeah? Who don't usually engage in in activism. They don't have the privilege of getting engaged with activism because they don't have the time. They don't have the childcare. So we go to them and we've been asking them, what are your demands? 
What are your demands for a better city? What do you need to, hap to happen in our city? Because it's you that is struggling with what's going on in our city right now. You're feeling it the most, yet you're not actually being represented because you don't have the time, you don't have the privilege to do that. So we need to bring it to them. Do you feel me? Okay. So, I won't go in for much longer. I'll just tell you about an example of a workshop that I did recently. And it was with um, the Asta Community Hub, which is the, in the Royal Docks, which is in North Woolwich. And these predominantly French West African women, um, single mothers, there's a lot of unemployment in the area, gang violence, there's London City Airport, which is planning to expand. You've got Crosswell on the other side of them. So you can see all of these things they're facing, but they're an extremely resilient community, but you can tell that they've been forgotten. What we did was we asked them for their demands and they came up with issues about immigration. If my child is born here and I'm a migrant, why is my child not automatically British? Yeah, why is that not happening? Why are they not equal beside their peers in a classroom in school? Why is that not happening? Okay, they came up with social housing issues. Issues about the environment, obviously, they're right beside an airport. And also they wanted to raise the London living wage. So these are some of the things that are going to be put in our manifesto, or at least they're going to be up for debate in our manifesto, yeah? But this is the people's manifesto. This is something that we need. We need this representation. Furthermore, we need someone to carry these demands through to the London mayoral elections, because that's what's really important. When you start seeing people of colour or work, um, working class people, women, in powerful positions, that's when you see things changing. So that's what we're going to do. We're searching for a candidate who will run for Take Back the City and who will carry through this People's Manifesto that we generate from all these different corners of London that we're going to. Because um, we need to engage with people. This, it's about time. I'll end with a quote from um, a delegate from that outreach session that I did. She's called Tracy Smith. She's a fiery woman. I love her. Um, <laughs> and she's the manager of that community centre. I personally would love her to be London Mayor. I think she'd do a great job. And she said, strong communities are a threat. And that's why Thatcher wanted to dismantle them. Guys, it's time to take back the city. Thank you. Amina from Take Back the City, which is precisely what we plan to do this evening and from now on. So uh, we're going to keep, keep the theme of London uh, and, and some of the things that Amina's picking up on, uh, how people's experience of living in the city can be very different depending on the background that you come from. Uh, and, then, and one of those experiences is the way in which you deal with the police. And we've had people talking about racism, uh, and, and there's the racism of individual personal prejudice, and then there's the racism that is structured around us, and the systemic institutionalised racism. Uh, and our next guy uh, is somebody who's been fearlessly tackling some of the issues with the police and proposing other ways of policing our city. So please welcome Adam Cooper. And an extra bit, I've forgotten. Jones. <laughs> hey everyone, um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about a blueprint, a utopic blueprint for policing and criminal justice. And I guess the first thing I thought about was, well, in a utopia, everyone will kind of behave themselves, so everything will be fine. But um, uh, that isn't good enough according to the organisers, so I'm going to have to talk about some other stuff as well, and maybe how we can get there. So I guess the first thing we should think about, about how we're going to get to a utopia, when it comes to policing and criminal justice, is thinking about crime. What is crime? What constitutes crime? And these sound like quite simple questions, but I think we can kind of problematize them a little bit when we ask quite simple questions about them. So for instance, one of the first things I thought about was, why is it if you're suspected of handling a gun in Tottenham, you'll be criminalized? You might even be shot on the spot before any questions are asked. But if you try and sell F-16s to Saudi Arabia, you'll probably get an OBE. In, at the same, in the same way, if you try to smoke a spliff on Brixton High Street, 
you'll probably get stopped by the police. But if you sell highly addictive antidepressants through the pharmaceutical industry, you're a pillar of industry. Oil extraction, we're often told, is a necessary burden on the landscape of our planet. But at the same time, graffiti artists are regularly given lengthy custodial sentences. And while begging on public transport and even on the streets is illegal, lobbying our supposed elected MPs is a normal part of a functioning democracy. And so when we start to think about what it means to be criminalized, what it means to be a criminal, it has less to do with any kind of moral judgment that's been made upon the actions of that person and has far more to do with the way in which that person has been classed and often racialized. And so when we look back and we think about the ways in which the police and the prison system has emerged, it's not emerged through any kind of moral impetus, but more in response to revolt and resistance, particularly by organized labor and by anti-colonial movements. And so in actuality, what the role of the police is, isn't to protect what we think is right, but it's to protect property, to protect property from appropriation and redistribution, or as they call it, theft. So the next question, I guess, is what compels people to engage in these criminalized acts? And I guess to answer this question, this question it's, often to think, it's often useful to think about the kind of liberal or left explanations that are often given, right? So people say, oh, there's someone who lives in poverty, or there's someone who may be ill-educated, or one of the famous ones is, one of the most popular ones is false consciousness. But I think these kind of explanations can be often problematic as well because they rely on what sometimes practitioners and academics call a deficit ideology. The person in the subordinated group is considered to be the person with the problem. So for instance, if someone in a working class community commits a racially aggravated offence, what will generally happen is they will receive some kind of uh, sentence and, that will be in, and what will be included in that will be some kind of diversity training. There will be no question about the role of the popular press in demonizing Muslims. There won't be any talk of the way in which our immigration policies criminalize people from other countries. And there will be no mention of the ways in which almost every institution that we interact with tells us that those who are racially minoritized are lesser than the rest of society. Thanks, 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 for, thanks for clapping the most depressing section of the talk. I appreciate that. So how do we get to this utopia? Well, some of the road has already been walked for us. And two of the key demands of many of the anti-police violence movements and many of the um, uh, um, one of many of the prison abolition movements in parts of the US, South Africa, Latin America, parts of Southern Europe, is that the police should not be above any laws or social agreements. This might seem like something quite obvious. When we think about the fact that on average one person a week dies at the hands of the British police and not a single officer has been brought to justice, we start to see quite stark patterns in the way in which we conceptualize justice for ordinary people and those who are the agents of the state, particularly its physical arm. And the second demand, again, is quite straightforward. It's community control of the police. It's the idea that communities should be served and should be able to hold accountable the police forces that um, operate within the areas in which they live. Because we often think that the role of the police is to prevent crime and catch criminals or being a deterrent to potential criminals, particularly catching criminals in the act, chases, all that stuff that you see on ITV 4, 5, 6. And in reality, the greatest deterrent of crime is not the police. It's meaningful work, adequate housing, a loving family and a community. And particularly important is those privileged by their gender, sexuality, race, or physical ability critically reflecting about the ways in which they, they interact with the rest of our society. So it's important practically for us to think about and to argue that the people who investigate crimes 
cannot and should not be the people with the powers to apprehend and detain anyone else. Any such physical powers should be controlled and regulated collectively by communities, not an internal army with a chain of command. In a society moving towards utopia, therefore, crime and justice would not look from the top down, trying to fix the subordinated, to become better accustomed to their social position. It would look from the bottom upwards at any remaining structures of domination which seep down into the lives of those below. With this in mind, our conception of what constitutes crime and crime prevention will be radically altered. The institutions which proliferate weapons, oil and medicine for profit will be dismantled, identified as the primary agents of social harm, both in the acts that they commit and the cultures of violence that they reproduce. The spaces and defences from bigotry and violence sought by women, LGBTQI communities, the racially minoritised and people with mental health issues and other subordinated groups in our society will drift towards irrelevance as attention is directed towards those who constitute the dominant group for education and critical self-reflection and change. There's no blueprint for utopia, but there is a roadmap and it's been sketched out by the makers of social change who faced our comparable challenges across different histories and geographies. And by drawing upon the insights across these spaces and our own realities, we can begin to move towards a society in which can, we can take ownership over the social ills we often struggle to question. Thank you. everyone speak but if you want to speak to any of our speakers they are around have a chat with them and talk to them about what they're thinking so next up we have from the Green Party Sean Berry it's gonna be really exciting to hear but just before that I'm gonna introduce you to somebody who's made this all happen his name is Neil Lawson and he's from Compass so please please put your hands together for Neil Lawson don't, don't go you haven't heard me yet um, your dad's just come home. You said it was going to be 10 people and a pizza. Come behave. Um, I'm Neil. I'm from Compass. We've helped put on tonight. I'd like to thank you for being here. I'd like to thank all of the performers, everyone that's made this happen. Look, maybe it's um, because I'm a Londoner that I think that we live in the, one of the richest cities in the world and that we've got enough to treat everyone with dignity and, and as a human being. And maybe it's because I'm a Londoner that I see a capital city which is pretty at ease with itself and its people and that we ought to be able to integrate and show solidarity and love and respect for each other despite everything that's thrown at us. And maybe it's because I'm a Londoner that um, I've got a funny feeling inside of me that what's coming up in London with the assembly elections and the mayoral elections isn't really about Zach Goldsmith or Tessa Jowell or David Lammy or any of those people. It's actually about us and Londoners and what we want to make of London and what we want to make of our capital city and realizing how powerful we are as people if we decide that we want the London of our dreams and the London of our utopia. If we join together, if we hold hands, if we show solidarity and love and respect and tolerance for each other and dream of something, everything that we hold dear starts with a dream. The NHS, the minimum wage, our our comprehensive education, everything starts with a dream and we can make London a much, much better place. And if we can't do it in London, with all its riches and all its tolerance, we can't do it anywhere. So it's a real, real test. Look at this thing up here, this monolith of this thing we face. Don't look at the boxes, look at the cracks in between, look at the light. It's in the light and in the cracks that we find the spaces in which we can change our capital, our London and our world by prizing that open together. 30 years ago, the clash played on this platform, right? And I can still hear London calling. It's calling us to produce and build a better kind of London. Um, uh, we can do it. We can do it if we believe in ourselves and the power that we have. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the Trust for London who have helped sponsor tonight and helped us work on this. Enjoy the rest of the evening and do just one thing. Believe in yourself 
and your ability to work with others to make our capital and our society and our country better. Thank you very much. Neil Lawson saying believe, 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 believe Camden. And the next speaker is someone who is very dear to Camden's heart. She's a councillor for Camden. She's an environmental activist and she hopes to run again for the Green a candidate to be London Mayor. Please put your hands together for Sean Berry! Hi, um, thank you for having me. It's absolutely extraordinary to be part of this um, and an honour to be here. Um, I'm a politician. I'm, I think I'm the only British politician they've allowed on the stage today. Um, I'm a Green councillor here in Camden. I am hoping to be the Green candidate for Mayor of London uh, next year, but I'm not here to tell you uh, to, to vote for me. Um, I'm also a campaigner and um, I've been in the Greens for 14 years and I've been uh, a campaigner for almost as long. I started out fighting the four by fours um, and I've done a lot of other things too. Um, and my politics and my campaigning has always been inspired by, for want of a better word, dissent. Um, and in Britain, our history of dissent and radical change is frankly admirable. As Owen said and, Ian, and Neil just talked about, the, the many different people making Britain their home have created the birthplace of trade unions, cooperatives, the home of the NHS, and were the inspiration for democratic movements around the world. From the levellers of the Civil War through the Chartists, the Campaign for Women's Suffrage, the peace, anti-apartheid, environmental movements, the struggles of radical groups are the history of our country. And I'm incredibly proud and sentimental about that history. Um, and uh, I loved the Olympic opening ceremony. I know it was cheesy. I love everything that Frank Cottrell Boyce writes and he makes me cry almost constantly, so I was more or less destroyed by the fact that he put this history that I care about into that ceremony so well. And in that ceremony, he picked out one passage from Shakespeare and put it in the mouth of Brunel. We're in a railway uh, setting here. Um, and the, and the, the bit of the speech was uh, from Caliban in Act 3 of The Tempest, in which he says, be not afeard, the land is full of noises. And uh, here in the Roundhouse today, we're surrounded by the voices and noises of people from Camden. And here in the Roundhouse, uh, there was a production of The Tempest as part of the Cultural Olympiad in 2012. So hopefully, the voices of the real actors who spoke those words are here in the room with us today as well. And, and now again, true to our history, it's our island's noises from the people and from the grassroots that are taking the Westminster bubble completely by surprise, again and again at the moment, starting a year ago, almost exactly, with the incredible participatory surge of radical debate and thought that came with the Scottish referendum, continuing with the huge leap in the membership of my party with the Green Surge, and now with a flood of supporters joining Labour to vote for a radical former anti-apartheid campaigner who's pro-peace anti-austerity to lead their party. I mean, I don't agree with Jeremy Corbyn on everything, and I've, I've talked about how the need for voting reform, deeper changes to democracy, um, needs to be more of what he does if he wins. But I've also talked about how exciting it is that so many people are getting involved in deciding the future of the Labour Party. And, and like Owen said as well, they're not excited by his personality or the idea that he personally will save them. It's by the ideas that he represents. These people are relishing the opportunity to have a more radical debate about the crisis we face. I'm absolutely, I mean, I'm from a Green, but I'm proud of all of you who've signed up to Labour to vote for something with a whiff of dissent. It's really, really good. Um, and this new excitement is reflected not in just in party politics and internal party contests and referendums. It's actually everywhere on the ground now. Um, it's our turn to be inspired by democratic movements. Syriza and Podemos are amazing. Uh, and looking around us, we can see citizens all over London, all over our city, springing up to challenge, resist, protest, and create new ideas for using their power. 
In London, we are a city of noises now. Um, and we're noisy because we're angry. We're angry with our lazy, disinterested mayor. We're in, angry with the lack of democracy, the way our streets and our estates are being rebuilt on a model dictated by big corporations, not the wishes of its citizens. We're angry at our filthy air, our eroded public spaces, and we're angry at the way inequality has grown to Victorian levels that Brunel would have recognized. In London, more than anywhere else too, inequality has grown uh, ridiculously. The richest people enjoy a steady increase in wealth. The rest of us have low wages, falling wages in some cases, expensive housing and draconian tests to get even the most basic levels of social support. As citizens ask of London, our response to this, yes, it's angry, but it's more constructive now than ever before. It's so much more constructive than a riot. All over the city, we've got a revival in campaign groups and activists challenging the current mayor, challenging their local councils and the government's injustices on housing, policing, we just heard, wages, jobs, our rights and safety and the environment we live in. And we're also seeing a revival in something else, which I think is really important. It's solidarity not only for activists working on the same cause, but between activists making the links between their different causes. It's the kind of solidarity we saw in 1984 when lesbians and gays support the miners made the links between the struggles of the miners and their struggle for equality and the common harassment and suppression they faced. More history of which we can be proud and, and also history here in Camden. The Pits and Perverts benefit concert was held at the Electric Ballroom just down the road, so you could probably hear the noises from there in this space as well. Um, I am really hopeful. All of this revival under another Tory government in activism, solidarity, radical debate, people willing to join causes and parties. I'm hopeful we can wrestle next year's London election, as Neil mentioned, um, away from the horse race, the tribalness of personalities, and make it something wider, involve all of London in deciding how we want to run our city. And groups like Take Back the City and Compass organizing this event, they're already doing this kind of work and they're adding to the hope that I have that this is possible. I think, in fact, given recent events, it would be somewhat unusual if 2016 in London wasn't an election in which something unusual happened. And we need to prepare for it now. I think this event is very well timed. I think those of us who are politicians need to work with people who aren't in parties, work with people with, from other parties. And everyone on the streets needs to get involved with campaigns like Take Back the City and build a vision for what London can be like. Um, that whoever becomes mayor, however the campaign goes, and something weird is going to happen, they can't ignore that vision. We can determine what London is like after next May. So yes, I, I'm, I think we can do something together next year. I think we can, we can not only work together, take over City Hall, but give it back to the people too. It's our city and it's our London and we deserve it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
There's the sisters. Uh, you, sound, you sound a bit pissed. <laughs> um, and we're fighting to stop uh, the closure of domestic violence services. Um, so the campaign began in November 2014, and I've worked in the domestic violence sector for about three years. And domestic violence has been uh, a big part of my working and campaigning life, I suppose, because domestic violence has been a massive part of my life generally. Um, growing up um, in the community that I grew up in, domestic violence was an everyday part of life. Every woman that I knew as a child um, had violence meted out on them by men on a regular basis. When I was nine, my best friend's mum was brutally murdered by her dad. And uh, when the police came and took her away, I never saw my friend again. And two women a week are murdered in this country by a current or ex-partner. And it actually used to be a lot higher in fact, the decline in murders generally in the UK over the last 30 years is directly correlated with the increase of women's refuges, housing, and um, the increase in economic independence of women over that period. That means, that means that most of the decline in murders over that period are women who would have died but did not because feminists fought for refuges, for housing, for benefits, for equal pay. Women's refuges, domestic violence services, services for women of colour, social housing, legal aid, access to benefits literally save women's lives every single day. Um, the cuts that have been implemented since 2010 are devastating women's lives and putting them in serious danger. And Sisters Uncut have taken and will continue to take militant direct action until our demands have been met. And we demand that all cuts to domestic violence services be stopped and that funding be reinvented nationally, that specialist services for women of colour be reinstated and expanded to meet the needs of the community, that legal aid be made available to all survivors of domestic violence, an end to no recourse to public funds that bars those with insecure immigration from receiving any welfare benefits, and social housing for all, but especially for women fleeing domestic violence. Yeah. So what is Sisters Uncut doing to change this situation? Well, as I said before, our first meeting was in November last year, and since then we've taken militant direct action on a number of occasions all over the city. Our meetings are, and our actions are open to all women, including trans, intersex, and cis, and all those who experience oppression as women, including non-binary people. Now, we organise this way because we are trying to create a safe space for survivors to organise in. Our actions tend to take a little bit um, of a formula. Um, usually, at the very beginning of the action, we will read out the names of all the women that have been murdered um, through um, domestic violence over the last year. Now, it's incredibly painful, um, but necessary to remember those who have not survived. We then take to the streets um, with our first action on Valentine's Day, um, culminating in a massive circular roadblock with all the sisters um, joining hands on the junction of Oxford Circus and blocking the road. Um, and our May Day action um, climaxed in a roadblock on, on the ground as well as um, an occupation of the roof of the London Council's building with a banner that was unfurled that said, we, they cut, we bleed. And that journey of beginning our actions by reading the names of women who have been murdered um, gives us the time to reflect and grieve over that. Then channeling that pain and rage into anger and taking to the streets to shut shit down as women is incredibly empowering. It's through taking direct action, through shutting shit down, making ourselves impossible for the government to ignore that we intend to halt all cuts to domestic violence services. But fun what, what is our utopian vision out of that as sisters? So fundamentally, sisters want to see a world in which violence against women is eradicated, which doesn't actually feel that utopian, to be honest. It ought to be fundamental to, the, to our existence, and yet um, it seems a far way off. But ultimately, the only way that violence against women will end is through uh, 
and a vision that's more utopian than just no violence, no more murders. Ultimately, the only way that violence against women will end is um, through smashing patri patriarchy and through, <laughs> and through the full liberation of women from all forms of oppression, from equal pay to the division of labors in the home. But as well as that, we understand that violence against women is inextricably linked to violence of the state. And we therefore want to see the dismantling of white supremacist institutions like the police, like the prison industrial complex, and we look forward to one day setting up our own community-based solutions through things like restorative justice. We know that oppressions are not separate from each other. The oppression I experience as a woman cannot be separated from the oppression I experience as a person of colour. You cannot eradicate the oppression of women without smashing white supremacy, without smashing capitalism, smashing homophobia, smashing transphobia, smashing the gender binary. Sisters Uncut see ourselves as part of a wider movement fighting for change through self-organisation as women, but also through intersectional organising, such as with our migrant sisters and brothers in Movement for Justice, or in solidarity with groups like uh, Black Dissidents. Women will be free when all oppressed people are free, and for that reason, we will continue to fight in solidarity with anyone fighting for their liberation. Thank you very much. Sarah Day! Strong words, important words. Words that will change things. I hope that you've listened to things today that made you change your mind about stuff. Or maybe your minds are already there. But talk to each other and talk to them and talk to everyone who's been up on stage and find out what they're saying about things. So. We're nearly at the end of the evening, ladies and gentlemen. But I've got one really enormous treat to give you. And this is a treat right from the heart of Camden, because yes, this guy runs a night at the Forge, down the road. Um, it's called Outspoken, and it's been one of these amazing grassroots poetry nights, which has just brought more and more people together to share music, to share words. He is a truly powerful being, and I'm absolutely delighted to bring him here to you. So. Can I actually, can I just, we, we're in a kind of sherry mood. Are we roundhouse? Are we in a sherry mood roundhouse? Yay! Let me give you the gift that many white settlers gave to lots of people in different countries. The gift of the clap. Let's start the clap. Let's start the clap. Let's bring it over here, over there, right around the back. Let's have this a bit more generous than a venereal disease. Let's have some weeping and cheering. Let's give it up. For two fantastic artists, Anthony and Natsugura and Clark Rock! Hello? late. Thanks for staying out. It's much appreciated. It would have been a bit, bit odd doing this to no one. So um, thanks for that. This is not a poem, and I am not a poet. When I'm unable to find a better way of saying that in 2012, 48 people in Great Britain were killed by guns, and 120 women killed by the hands of their beloved partners. I am not a poet when I can't find a more beautiful way to say that no nation in the world imprisons as many members of its population as America does. That more black men in the US are incarcerated today than what they were during the peak of South Africa's apartheid. No, I am not a poet when I can't find clever words to illustrate the fact that before 2008, Nelson Mandela had been on America's list of most dangerous terrorists for over 60 years. That Cameron is a liar. That Cameron was a key member of the Federation of Conservative Students in 18 I hope to hang Mandela, forgive me, because today I am not a poet and this is not a poem. When eloquent words fail me and I can't capture the struggle of the poor, 
through the metaphysics of language that by the time Margaret Thatcher left office in 1990, the annual incomes of the richest 0.01% of British society had climbed to 70 times the national mean. And I don't know how I feel about the fact that key policy makers and leading civil servants have never had a job outside of their politics. The same men who set the minimum wage with only 4% ever having worked in manual trades, of which 68% went to private schools. That is why this is not a poem and I am not a poet, because everything I've ever written suffers the weight of its own futility when another mother comes to a workshop with a fresh black eye, when there's another empty seat in the place that James sat in last week, and when I ask the group where he is, their young eyes open wet, as if his coffin in that moment was being lowered into them. But you see, I can understand all this more when they cut funding to schemes that aimed at inspiring people previously inspired by crime and the insufferable dross of mainstream culture, private prison systems and prisons for profit. When young women are given more options than just be someone's girl, be someone's mother, be someone's silence. But you see, I've done it again. I've crossed themes. I've not followed traditional poetic form. And so I'm a terrible poet because how do I speak words in prison then tell a young black person that they were once kings and queens of lands whose names fall dead on their tongue. How do I return their history? How do I mention the Marriott excavation, Shikanta Diop, and the skin cell sampling of 300 mummies? How do I show them pictures of skyscrapers before skyscrapers even existed? How do I do all this and then have them ask what part of the world I am from? Why well, I don't write poetry about 1974, Elga and Kissinger, until I tell them that I am not a poet and nothing I can write will help dismantle this idea of race that we've become so attached to. Nothing I can write will include the importance of mitochondrial DNA and the 99.99% of us that is identical, that a BNP member most probably has more Asian and Arab in them than the mosque that they conspire to blow up. The immigration isn't a choice. The people don't come to the UK for great weather, hospitality and quality of life. How do I explain all this and still retain artistic merit? I spent days looking for a metaphor to put the Palestinian Nakba in until I found a home that wants to beautiful and prim and then I opened the door and saw its contents ransacked, its family massacred and its garden on fire. From that day I abandoned any hope of metaphor and accepted that I could not write poetry about this. That everything I tried to imagine had already slit its own stomach like the afternoon I spent with a woman who had been raped and asked her to capture it in verse. I asked her to use simile and alliteration until she looked at me and said I don't know what those things mean but I can tell you in a few simple words what it feels like to live with the Satan of your own heart poetry isn't for me it's for people who can use words like odoriferous while putting red wine to the lips of their white skin and applaud the technical endeavor of a poem it's wit it's ingenuity it's meter and form not it's helping not the ambulance siren that screeches from the height of its title that is why this is not a poem and i am not a poet because i cried reading douglas dunn aaron kalatka Borges, and neruda i cried when i went looking for female poets and found few i cried when asked how many black poets penguin had ever published and was told too when my English teacher told me that language wasn't my strength that my anger crushed my intelligence that I should think about going and learning a trade and I cried then too when I spoke to a group of young men about what it was to be a man how we inherit this cancerous culture how we inherit misogyny objectification and the glory of violence while silently suppressing the sensual these were all the hardest things to write about to talk about and to live with that is why I keep saying this is not a poem and I am not a poet because all of the above digress and ignore the rules set by the establishment. But all that doesn't matter because it's done now. You've come this far in listening. Endings are always the hardest things to write because the author knows that's the last impression the reader will be left with. So I chose the following wisely. We are made up of all the things that broke us just to keep us alive. Maybe I could have said just that, but I didn't. Because like I said, this is not a poem, and I am not a poem. Thank you. This last poem contains some strong language and some poetry. It's called You.
You're a machine rummaging the bins for a paper god. Searching for yourself in the ripples of sulfuric rivers of torn celebrity ambitious blades Slicing tongues and words slaughtering language and laugh shadows eaten by brick and mortar Wrapping themselves in the hard metal of heated wire and black bitumen the tight fumes of great industry the yellow forest of decay Fuck again in polished flesh scented and wet lubricated groans spoil the ancient trajectory of stars catch the lackluster of spirit Spirit, the spilling of mind, you, your reckless menace cutting earth, your pockets can hold only holes, you bankrupt wings, ruin warmth, the sclerosis of flight and time, you unearth heaven, you point with teeth grinning at the shape of your dead, lone coffin sail out towards the end like pure planets looking for space, your prisons are not stone and wall or cage and law, they are decadence and knuckle and sorrow and rainbow, they are atonement and antipathy, they are you and you are them you cut uneven your music dead your stage is stark your university's windowless ill pedagogue perverse dictums yours is a horrible politics one saddled on exploitation nepotism and decree you know nothing of the heart of the flawed and the lonely your courtrooms are dominated by white wigs forged systems of justice and hammer the sentence choked in the language of life I can't breathe reach out and touch the 11th minute for the last time but it's been the last time forever shoot for the police for cartoons drawn for profit and blood drawn for gun and war shoot for freedom of speech for freedom to pray for freedom to walk down the street with sweets and make it home alive to grow into the rest of your life shoot with poems in the heart with fist gripping words like freedom of speech is not absolute because I've seen your people you're hushed and you're censored you're exiled and you're villainized you where were your cameras and puns it's when we march for women, march for Iraq before anybody was Charlie, when it was not in our name for 200 Nigerian girls, for 2,000 Nigerian bodies, for Palestine, for Diego Garcia, for Guantanamo Bay, for the Aboriginal burning his skin on the last embers of your acerbic racism, one you've manufactured so well, your finest export, you will never know what it's like to fly through the folds of love and compassion, through the burning vein of another fallen being. You'll never feel that moment when your heart for a second beats to something else. You'll never know height. You spray your sky with pestilence, choke the sun with burly clouds. Your world collapsing under pistons and cogs. Your art is rust, your mainstream polluted. You live with the lethargy of skeletons, tracing over the faint filaments that flicker and die. You're full of cock and rage and cunt and spit, drowning alive in worlds of neon of electricity you're gone there's nothing left your children dream to rob each other of their innocence you teach them your greed your capitalism and your supremacy your seeds are bullets precise and intractable your muscles are tanks your strength is destruction your clothes are flags and your hands are complete chaos yes I know you where you come from and where you go why you do it and why you did it. So when my son comes into this world and asks me on one very ordinary day, Daddy, why? I'll bring him in close, holding his little hand in mine, his chest still beating and his eyes reflecting the flames. And in that moment, I'll confess, because there's still hope, there's still love, still you. Okay, Anthony and Aksaguru and Karim. Woo! Can you please give up for those guys one more time? Woo! All right, guys, we, we've got to wrap it up very quickly, but we're not going to leave you without giving you back the poem that we've written together, a collective utopia to finish off the evening. Uh, thanks very much to the Roundhouse and to Compass for putting it on and all the people involved in this event. So give them a round of applause. Give yourselves a massive, massive round of applause for, like true um, believers in equality, sitting on a cold, hard floor for the whole evening, for sharing the same air, for sharing your thoughts with each other. Give yourselves a round of applause. Yeah. And if you weep, be and, nice and to yourself. And make sure as well that you don't just 
It's not, it's not empty words, is it, tonight? You're all going to be going out and getting involved with stuff and trying to make a change because it's got to mean something, hasn't it? Uh, and we have built your collective utopias out of the poem, out of the things you wrote on post-it notes. So blame yourselves for how these poems go. <laughs> do you want to go first or shall I? No. <laughs> oh, do we all want Sam to go first? Yeah, Sam's going first. Round of applause for Sam. <laughs> all right, guys. Wakey, wakey. What a world. The day unfurled before us, and of course it's warm. I don't have to clean my teeth, because the food I eat makes my teeth strengthen and harden. I go out and smell the flowers in the organic garden. No one judges me for who I am. Mistakes of the past are forgotten. Even though I once voted Tory, it's now forgiven. The trees and sheeps and something places for fun so i just as a because i can i run and i run feeling smarter wearing a tiara listening to hip-hop running my road in my spangly flip-flops i watch the seeds of smiles grow in a slow scene they used to think of me as a trans masculine faux queen but those labels are gone now all value all and the beautiful the ugly as well it doesn't matter if you don't know how to spell of course trade is fair in it we build a space for the spirit and the evening comes not too late and I go out for a date with Owen Jones to a gig. No one's on their mobile phones because they're more concerned with the real world and what's around. Let's take back this town. All smiles, no frown, fist clenched, bottom up, the world turned upside down. Thank you very much. I'm Sam Bergson. Thank you. OK, and this is the last bit of the night completely. So. Um, the road to utopia. The road to utopia is paved with tolerance, good intentions, and chips. Not even people who voted Tory will be judged. No, here, instead, we will give love freely and give according to need. And art will be valued for what it does for expression and beauty, not profit. No holiday here. This is the road. A journey, not a destination. No timeshare shitty bits in Spain for us, no. Utopia has trees and sheep and people and love in it. Where well, Owen Jones replies to a note I sent him asking for a date because I am brave and I wrote that note. Who wrote the note? Even though it makes my palms sweat, it's a bit scary. Utopia. Utopia is where people are like you regardless of your ability to spell. Utopia is never throwing away that pint glass and not being the roundhouse and allowing plastic pint glasses to exist. Roundhouse, sort it out. And also because there's no plastic, because we've managed to sort that out as well. And you know what, in this utopia, I brush my teeth because it's normal, and I eat my normal cereal because it's normal, and I go to a work and I get adequately paid because that's normal in this utopia. And it's a queer feminist brown sort of utopia, and that's normal. And it's trans inclusive, and that's normal. And it's normal, and normal, and normal in this utopia for everyone else, too, and all of you. So thank you very much, utopians. Good night, and make the world better. Thank you very much. And if you want to see more of what Michelle Madsen and I do, we run a night called Hammer and Tongue we, uh, we, in September. There's one at the Green Note Cafe, yeah? It's, uh, yeah, it's on the second Monday in September, and this is the world's shortest plug. And we've also got one in Hackney, Tuesday 1st of September. I'm going to give you a flyer. I've got books of poems to sell. Give a brother a tenner, man. I'll give you a book of poems. Capitalist, All right, take care. Capitalist, Bye. capitalist. Thank you very much to the Roundhouse for having us and to Compass and to everybody who performed. You've all been brilliant and to you guys as well. Thanks.